Let go. Who? What do you mean, who? Didn't you see him? Oh, come on. Whoever he was, Miss Westbrook, he never got inside the safe. The metal's got a few scorch marks on it, but uh, it looks like the lock wasn't even touched. No thanks to you. How did he get past security? Uh, we're working on it. Well, work on it on your own time, because you are fired. A lot of... We don't even know how it happened yet. Stu's worked for us for five years. Look, I don't care how it happened. It's time for a change. Alana, I have those contracts for your signature. Uh, later, Eight. Scott. You were going to choose the girl for the national advertising campaign. Oh, not now. Alana, this is the third day they've been here. All right, all right. I think we can do better. Girls, I'm really sorry. Thank you, ladies. If there are any future opportunities, I have your numbers. Somewhere out there, there is a girl with the perfect look. Well, at least the formula's safe. That's the important thing. Yeah. And it is going to remain safe. That's why I'm taking it home. Home? Oh, Lana, you can't do that. The formula's too valuable. Well, you can't stop me. As CEO, I have a responsibility to the company and to your stockholders. You're going to do what you're told, Barbara, just like everyone else around here. You are constantly undermining my authority. If you won't let me do the job you hired me to do, then why don't you let me out of my contract? So you can become the CEO at Winston Cosmetics? Who told you? Oh, Scott is a very efficient and well-connected executive assistant. I want out, Alana. I want out. Oh, I understand. I understand Winston offered you $200,000 a year plus bonuses. Very generous. Too bad you already have an ironclad contract with me. Mrs. Westbrook? Dr. Shell, as I'm sure you've already heard, there was a break-in last night. An attempt was made to steal the ingenue formula. Yes, they didn't get it. I know, but uh, I'm going to take sole responsibility for its security. That's why I'd like you to turn over all your notes and files on the project. I, I don't understand. You don't have to. Just open the cabinet. Well, Mrs. Westbrook. Doctor. Now. Mrs. Westbrook, don't do this to me. These files represent years of work. They're irreplaceable. Without them, I would never be able to reconstruct the fort. You don't have to. I told you, I'm going to make sure it's safe. Lana, I do not think it is fair that you retain sole possession. Doctor, I own that patent. Now, you developed the Ingenue formula as a salaried employee under my supervision. If you don't know what that means, I will be very happy to have my attorney explain it to you. All right. The cabinet. Everybody out. Thank you. Scott, I want you to call a press conference. Alana, I don't think the press is going to be that interested in a simple robbery attempt. Oh, I have a much bigger story than that. I'm going to tell them things even you don't know. In fact, this is a product so revolutionary that the competition actually sent burglars to try to steal it.
Unfortunately, they didn't get it. Are you telling us people are committing industrial espionage just to get their hands on some new wrinkle cream? Oh, no, 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 no. This is much more than that. This is an entirely new discovery that I've developed and I've tested on myself. I call it Ingenue. Remember that name. You know how most women lie about their ages? I know I always did. Well, today I'm finally going to tell you the truth. In fact, I'm going to show you copies of my birth certificate and my family records to prove it. Are you going to tell us that you're really 20? No, no, au contraire. Janice? Is this for real? Check it out for yourself. The original of that birth certificate is on file in Porterville, Colorado, where I was born. 62 years ago. Alana, what are the ingredients in this new wrinkle cream? Wouldn't you like to know? Well, that's certainly a triumph for you, my darling. Oh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, uh, please sit down. You know how I hate to have people read over my shoulders. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry. You know, I can't help feeling concerned about this formula being right here in the house, particularly after they tried to break into your office. Well, the formula's in my safe. You, of all people, should know how hard it is to get into my bedroom. Oh, come on, damn it. A lot of that isn't funny. Arthur, I'm talking about the security system. You have gotten so short-tempered. I, mean, I used to be able to turn to you for, for help, for guidance, for support. Yeah, for money. It was never just the money, Arthur. But now all I get from you is whining. Snide little rat. Who? Harley Griswold. This time he has gone too far. What did he say? Uh, never mind. Eric, have my car brought around in five minutes. Yes, ma'am. Are you going? Wait, the caterer is coming with designs for the birthday cake. Uh, that's all right, that's all right. They know what I want. And uh, uh, don't bother to wait up for me. I'll be late. Do you have something to do? Yes, sir. Then do it. Yes, sir. Harley, darling, are you talking about me? Alana, my angel, you don't look a day older and considering the vital statistics, that's quite an achievement. You know Beverly Courtney, don't you? How are you, darling? Harley, I want to talk to you. I'm so serious. I wonder if she's miffed because I'm having lunch with another of my lovely admirers. Oh, Harley, you're such a tease. Tease isn't exactly the word I had in mind. Have you read Shirley's column today? I have. You're in it. And what did I say this time? Nothing terrible, I hope. Harley's always saying terrible things. Beverly, darling, shut up. According to a well-connected writer friend, a certain cosmetic queen's dramatic revelation of her true age couldn't have come at a better time. Rumor has it that recent financial drains have left her beauty empire teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. You don't think that I tell Shirley about your financial problems, do you? Let's see, a well-connected writer friend... Why, Harley, I do believe you are the only writer I know. And you are certainly the only person who knew that I was having financial problems. That is, of course, until this came out. Alana, I swear I never said a word to Shirley. At least not that I can recall. Harley, you know, you drink too much. And darling, when you drink too much, you talk too much. Alana, my darling, what can I do to win your forgiveness? You can drop dead, darling. Beverly, I do hope you'll think twice before you tell him any secrets. You never know what might turn up in print. Darling? 
time. I don't believe you. You couldn't be 62. Oh, I don't look too bad, do I? For my age. That cream is really a miracle. You must rub it all over your body. Doesn't it ever bother you to be sleeping with someone almost old enough to be your grandmother? I haven't even thought about it. Do you want to know what I do think about? Why don't you tell me? a very effective little job you did the other night. Well, you said you wanted the break in attempt to look realistic. You were right to get your valuables out of that safe. The security around here stinks. Yeah, you certainly proved that to my satisfaction. Uh, what about that other little matter I asked you to look into? Well, it took some digging, but I think I found what you were looking for. It's not going to make you happy. Oh, well, you'd be surprised what makes me happy. Oh, everything all right for the party tonight? I think so. Great. Sure you won't come? Uh-huh. Chicken. <laughs> Have a happy birthday. Oh, thanks. Della. Oh. How's the new boat? How's your knee? Wet. The office has been trying to reach us for days. They finally got a message through to the store down the road. Important? I don't think so. Somebody named Westbrook wanted you to go to a birthday party tonight. I uh, said you couldn't go. Who's Westbrook? We went to law school together. Almost two years. You never mentioned him. Oh, five years out of law school, he went into business. Made a fortune. We were good friends. Haven't seen him since 77. How'd it go out there today? You were right. We were bitten to death. I yeah, didn't catch a thing. We're out of this tournament. Yesterday the boat sank, Perry wrecked his knee, and we lost all our fish. We can go home as far as I'm concerned. Those are mine. Alana, darling, happy birthday. Thank you. I can't believe how marvelous you look. I just pray that when I get to be your age... Darling, don't worry. Anjana will be out soon. I do hope you can afford to wait. Alana, my angel, I've been calling you for days, but you're never home. And I never will be home to you again, Harley. In fact, you weren't invited. Get out of my house. I was getting around that I'm no longer on your list. You've no idea the harm it's doing me. I couldn't be more thrilled. Darling, but don't say you're ruining me. Be a shame. Eric! Eric, Mr. Griswold is having trouble finding the door. Please show him out. Mr. Griswold, if you please, sir. This way. Darling, I want to talk to you. Excuse me. Arthur. Arthur. You must show me your guns, you know. I've been learning to shoot, and I want to ask your advice on what I should buy. Well, you know, I only uh, have target guns. Well, uh, what did you use in the Olympics? That's the Walter 22 right there. That's a silhouette uh, pistol. 
Извини. Alana, I would like a copy of my notes. Now? Alana, this is intolerable, please. And impossible. We'll have to talk about it tomorrow. Alana? Tomorrow. Happy birthday. thinking uh oh arthur darling it's so late not tonight uh, well good night darling i'm uh, happy birthday thanks Lana? Lana, did I hear you mention having breakfast with the uh, Esmonds today? Are you awake? I'm, I'm coming in. How long have you worked here? I've been in the employment of Mrs. Westbrook for seven years. 
from what you've been telling me, it sounds like you don't like Mr. Westbrook. He didn't treat Mrs. Westbrook very well. Your name again? Eric. Eric, hang tight. I'll get back to you. As you wish, sir. Officer, I need to talk to you for a moment. I found something I think you're going to be interested in. Mr. Westbrook. Mr. Westbrook, Lieutenant Brock, please. Mind if I ask you a question or two, sir? I don't mind. Okay, to begin with, looks like a thief broke into your house, stole one of your guns, went upstairs and surprised your wife while she was putting away her jewels in the bedroom safe. Bang. He shoots her, grabs the jewels, and splits. And while all of this was going on, my guys tell me, you never heard a thing. Well, I take a sleeping pill, Lieutenant. It's very effective. I wish I had heard something. I might have been able to do something. Might have been able to do something. Lieutenant? Excuse me, sir. an update, sir, on what we think happened because something is not quite kosher. Uh, I understand. Well, to begin with, sir, your wife's jewels were found in a mailbox just down the street from your house. But we didn't find the formula for your wife's anti-aging cream, the one that Dr. Shell told us about. Now, that means that the thief, if there was a thief, wanted the formula and not the jewels. Which means that the thief, if there was a thief, knew precisely what he was looking for. Why do you keep saying if there was a thief? I mean, somebody broke in here. <laughs> Mr. Westbrook, nobody broke into this house, sir. What about that window? Ah, Mr. Westbrook, the window broken from the inside out. You see, the thief, your wife's killer, wanted us to think he broke into the house, but we think he was inside all along. Inside? Inside, Mr. Westbrook. In fact, we think he's still here. And we think we'll be able to prove it. Prove what? The butler says you and your wife, well, you didn't get along. Would you like to tell us about it? You should get started as soon as possible. I think you should change lures and fish the center of the lake. I was very comfortable on the dock. Oh, come on, Della. You were lucky. How about some coffee? Right away. You know, you really should get in a few hours before the sun gets too hot. Oh, Ken, Della knows what she's doing. Take it from me. <laughs> she will win the tournament. Mr. Mason, got a message for you. Head of the firm is there. Thank you, Admiral. What is this, another invitation to a party? <laughs> Not quite. Arthur Westbrook's wife was shot last night. And he's been charged with murder. The lawyer took care of the hearing. I took care of bail. Hey, Barry. I can't thank you enough. Too early for thanks. According to the police report, your butler told Lieutenant Brock you had violent arguments with the latter. Oh, damn that man. He'll be a witness for the prosecution. It's too bad you didn't get along with him. Eric is a butler. I pay him to get along with me. How long were you and Alana married? Oh, almost ten years. Did you argue? <laughs> of course we argued. Every couple argues, for God's sake. Eric says quite a few of your arguments concern money, Alana's money. Alana's money? <laughs> I gave her every cent I have. It was a lot. I just wanted to get some of it back out of the business. Arthur, do you realize that wanting your money back is enough motive for the police? What? They haven't found the murder weapon, but they did find the shell casing, and your fingerprints were on it. Well, they stole my bullets. 
We can't prove that. The DA does think he can prove you killed Alana to get the formula for her face cream. He'll claim you knew the formula was in her safe, and only you could have faked the break-in to throw off suspicion. Where are you? What, what are you trying to do? Get me more upset? I'm under arrest for murder. Thanks, Dylan. Sit down. My partner, Ken Melansky, is going to visit the crime scene with Lieutenant Brock in the morning. Before you leave here, I want you to go over all the pictures from the party with Della. But right now, I'd like you to tell me about this cream your wife invented. It really worked? Oh, yes. Arthur, how old was Alana? I haven't the slightest idea. Morning, Lieutenant. Morning, Miss Melansky. Sorry I'm late. Go on in. What do we got? Take a look around. Who are you? My name is Melansky. Ken Melansky. I work with Perry Mason. Mason, the lawyer? You a lawyer too, Melansky? <laughs> Don't tell me you got something against attorneys. Ever know a cop who didn't? Who said you could be in here? Lieutenant Brock. He's outside. Ask him. I will. In the meantime, don't go anywhere. Don't touch anything. Clear? You're not going to find anything, Melansky. Forensic swept the place clean yesterday. I had to tell your investigator that. She acted like I was trying to sneak out with vital evidence. What investigator? Tall, blonde, nice looking. She was going to go look for you. She was just here. Just now? Yeah, just now. She just drove away. It wasn't one of yours? The only woman on my squad is Lenny Rodriguez, and she ain't no blonde. She had an ID, Lieutenant. Darius Quinn. I wrote her name and license number in the law. Turn the one, it's a dead end. This is not another one of Mason's scams, is it, Melansky? Getting us running around in circles looking for some mystery woman? Give me a break, Lieutenant. Perry and I don't work that way. You know, I know that by now. After you. Arthur and I went through every picture from the party. These three knew the formula was in the house. William Shell? Mm -hmm. The chemist who developed Arginet. Barbara Fox? Alana's CEO. And Scott Collins? Her executive assistant. You're holding one back. Harley Griswold. Arthur said that he and Alana had a terrible fight the night of the party. Fight? About what? He only knew that Harley crashed the party and Alana threw him out. Well, Mr. Melansky. Sorry I'm late. I was downtown with Lieutenant Brock. He traced our mystery woman's license plate. Rental car, phony name, dead end. She's evidently a professional. Professional enough to murder? I'm starving. Have you ordered yet? No, we've been waiting for you. Waiter! Arthur identified four suspects today. No, tomorrow. You want me to check out that break in at Alana's offices because it's connected. You're finished with everything else. Everything jibes with the official police report. Well, Rock is certainly putting together a good case against us. I just got a glimpse of him going down the hall, all in black with some kind of mask over his head. That's all I saw. This intruder, you think it could have been a woman? I don't know. I didn't think about it. In other words, you wouldn't say yes, and you wouldn't say no. I'd say maybe. More than that, pal, I don't know. Mr. Collins' office is around the corner down the hall. Great, thanks a lot.
Who? The blonde woman. I didn't see anybody. Excuse me. Can I help you? I'm looking for a woman. Tall? Blonde? Not in here. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Long line. Uh, tall blonde wearing a white blouse and a dark skirt. I saw her coming out of that office there. It's got to be Lauren Kent. She was here a few minutes ago. Who is she? She worked for Alana. Doing what? Special projects like the party. Occasional dirty tricks, stabs in the back. Whatever Lauren Kent was doing, Alana kept secret. Well, she doesn't work for Mrs. Westbrook anymore. Now, what was she doing here? She said she had some loose ends to tie up. So do I. You know how I can find her? Well, her employment file's in the computer. That's funny. I can't bring her up. Her file's been erased. Could she have gotten her hands on one of those terminals? Well, there's another one in Mrs. Westbrook's office. She was in there. You don't think that she could have erased it herself, do you? Now, there's a thought. Did you pay her by check? She picked up her last one today, yeah. You have any of the canceled checks? The name of her bank will be stamped on the back of the check. Hello? I'm back, Ken. Good, Lauren Kent's here. Why should I talk to you now, Mr. Malansky? Either here and now, Ms. Kent, or on the witness stand under oath. Suppose I just disappear. We'll find you. And then you can explain to Lieutenant Brock what you were doing at the Westbrook mansion impersonating a police officer. My name is Lauren Kent. I'm a PI. Here's my license. I've known Alana since I was a kid. I did a couple of jobs for her and then she hired me on a permanent basis. What were you working on? She had me checking out some of her employees. Alana wasn't exactly what you'd call a trusting person. Your employer is dead. Why are you still investigating? I want to find out who killed her. You don't think it was her husband? No. For some inexplicable reason, Arthur loved her. Why do you care who it was? Two reasons. First, I have this old-fashioned idea that anyone who commits a murder should be punished. Call me crazy. And second? If I solve this case, I'll never have to hustle for another job. I'll be famous, and like Mr. Perry Mason, the jobs will come to me. Does it work that way, Ken? Look, Mr. Mason, we both believe that your client is innocent. Maybe we can help each other. Have you spoken to Harley Griswold? Why? Alana was worried about him. Seems he has a temper. Seems he's dangerous when he's crossed. <laughs> he doesn't look very dangerous. Mr. Mason... You, of all people, ought to know just how deceiving looks can really be. That's very true, Ms. Kent. Isn't that so, Mr. Malansky? 
Mason. Mr. Griswold. You're sitting at my table. Yes, I know. Won't you sit down? Sit down. Thank you. Uh, Beverly Courtney, this is the uh, famous Perry Mason who is attempting to pull dear old Arthur's bat out of the fire. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you tell us about Arthur's struggle for justice. Must be an uphill battle. All struggles are uphill. Dear Arthur has such a charming personality that I'm afraid most people would be quite happy to see him in jail, innocent or not. How about you, Mr. Griswold? Do you think he's innocent or not? Well, even if he did kill Alana, who'd blame him? She treated him badly. Very, very badly. Everybody knew it. And you? Did she treat you very badly? We had our ups and downs. Oh, Holly, you're being too kind. The woman was a monster. You should have heard the way she spoke to him. I never would have put up with it. Anything further, Mr. Mason? Perhaps now is not the time. Oh, you can say anything you want in front of Beverly. God knows I always do. Go ahead, Mr. Mason. I love a little scandal. All right. Is it true you were taking large sums of money from Alana Westbrook? Who told you that? Is it true? Well, she gave me little gifts from time to time. Gifts of cash? Well, Alana was very generous. That's how you live, isn't it? Well, I, I accept the uh, generosity of uh, some of my devoted lady friends, yes. So your falling out with Alana endangered your livelihood? I think I should probably leave you two alone after all. Thank you, Mr. Mason, for your exquisite sense of discretion. My sense of discretion was your idea. Now, you left Alana's birthday party at about 10 o'clock. Where did you go then? Home. Which is where I'm going now. Good day, Mr. Mason. Why don't we just say au revoir? I'm sure we'll be seeing each other again. I think I got us a killer. I told Harley Griswold that I have a photo of him sneaking back into the Westbrook house the night of the party. I also told him for $10,000 I'd sell him the negative instead of giving the photo to the police. You can't do that. That's blackmail. Not really, because there isn't any photo. But if he thinks there is and he tries to buy it, we've got our man. <laughs> Perry's gonna love this. Well, it's a good thing we didn't ask his permission, isn't it? Tell me something. Are you really as tough as you act? Stick around and find out. Griswold told me that he'd get the money and he'd meet me at the Grillo Center parking lot at 10 p.m. tonight. All he's got to do is show and we've got it. Oh, oh, yes. The original idea for Ingenue was mine. We met in Switzerland 20 years ago. I was in research and development, she in marketing, for a Swiss cosmetics firm. We began working on an age-reversing skin product then. Did she bring you to America? Alana was obsessed with this research of mine. When she set her company up, she sent for me, made me her chief chemist. She'd be the first to tell you that my contribution to Ingenue was essential. Unfortunately, she isn't in a position to tell us anything. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Twenty years I've worked on this project. 
And because my notes were destroyed, I can offer no proof of my contribution or even reconstruct the formula. Alana destroyed your notes. Weren't you worried she might use that to cut you out of your share of the profits? Alana was my friend. She always dealt honorably with me in the past. I trusted her implicitly. Even though she had the only copy of your formula in her bedroom safe? Yes. You knew that's where it was. She told me herself. A lot of Westbrook trusted me, Mr. Mason, and I trusted her. I was probably the only person at the company she did trust. What about Lauren Kent, Barbara Fox? Lauren works part-time. But are you aware that Barbara Fox and Alana had a falling out the very afternoon she took the formula home? Falling out over what? Barbara had made some bad investments and covered them with company funds. When Alana found out, she threatened Barbara's career. If you're looking for a motive, Mr. Mason, possibly you should talk to Barbara Fox. Ingenue projects millions in profits, Dr. Shell. That's plenty of motive for any number of people. Tonight he's gonna need some repairs. Bore it. Bore it. Hey, it's breaking and entering. So Griswold tried to kill us. We're even. You coming? No, you can't do that. Watch me. from Schönheit Gesellschaft, and I'm leaving this message to confirm that I will be meeting your flight when you arrive here on the 19th, as per your fax. I wish you a safe journey. Goodbye. Schönheit means beauty, Gesellschaft means corporation. I know that! Griswold is meeting with someone from a Swiss cosmetic firm. Maybe he's got something to sell. What do you think? myself on my coffee. Can I take your coat for you? No, I won't be staying long. I, I take it black. A purist after my own heart. So what can I do for you, Mr. Mason? Tell me about the argument you and Alana Westbrook had the night of her party. I wouldn't really call it an argument. No? I understood she looked very angry. Well, an executive assistant either learns to take his boss's heat or he finds another job. But your relationship went far beyond work, didn't it? What do you mean? My friends have been doing a little research on your standard of living. The rent on this apartment alone is more than your monthly salary. I have investments. 
Mr. Collins, both your rent and the lease on your car have been paid by checks drawn on one of Alana's private accounts. So what's your point, Mr. Mason? That I'm a kept man? That Alana and I were lovers? More or less? Well, you're right. So what does that prove? That gives me a motive to want her alive, not dead. Yes, she paid for my rent, my car, my clothes. But now that she's dead, that's all over. Did you know you were extremely well provided for in her will? I don't have to answer that question, Mr. Mason. You don't have me on the stand yet. Oh, but I will, Mr. Collins. I will. Morning. Morning, sir. How can I help you? Looking for a Jaguar Mark II sedan, early 60s. You want to buy a classic Jag, do you? Come to the right place here. Actually, I'm looking for one in particular, a dented left front fender, a wing, you'd call it. Mind if I take a look through your service base? Wouldn't be one of them insurance blokes, would you? No, I'm an attorney. I'm working on a murder case. Name's Melansky. So? So, I can get a court order to look through your books and your service base. But why make things difficult on both of us? Bloody lawyers. Come on. Hey, huh? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, that's it. Who does it belong to? Oh, come on, mate. There's a limit. I've got to respect the confidence of my customers. I can understand that. Mr. Griswold wants to keep this under wraps, doesn't he? If you know everything already, why ask me? Bloody lawyers. Barbara Fox. Um, my secretary told me you were waiting. I, I've been expecting a visit from you. Really? Well, ever since the head of accounting told me your Della Street was trying to get a look at the company books. You had the book sealed, Miss Fox. I was hoping I could persuade you to change your mind. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but the company's financial records are strictly confidential. But now that Alana is dead, you must control the company funds. That's correct. Big responsibility. I can handle it. For the time being. Eventually, of course, uh, there'll be an audit. With the books closed, people could imagine you might be trying to hide something. Mr. Mason, the books are in order. Ah. Uh, I'm relieved to hear that, Ms. Fox. This is a subpoena deuces taken. It requires you to be in court tomorrow morning. It also requires your books to be there. Also, das weiß ich. Herr Messen wird Sie im Sommer, wenn er in Holland im Haag ist, anrufen. <lacht> ja, ja. Dankeschön, Herr Direktor. Auf Wiedersehen. Carl Schlusner says I need to work on my accent. Anyway, Griswold faxed him there yesterday, saying he was coming into Zurich next week in order to discuss a significant business proposition involving a new product. Unfortunately, Griswold wasn't any more specific than that. His travel agency said that Griswold faxed them two days ago, requesting a one-way ticket to Zurich on the 18th. He contacted both of them by fax. Mm -hmm. What's the problem? Well, I'd feel better if he'd spoken to them. Anyone could have sent those faxes. To implicate Griswold. Perry, he tried to kill us last night. That proves he's our man. Does it? I show you State Exhibit G. Do you recognize this shell kitchen? Uh, yes, it has my mark on it, and it was found in the room where Lana Westbrook was killed. 
Now, is this casing similar to the ones used by the defendant for target shooting? Yes, it was compared to other bullets found in the defendant's house. That's an exact match. Were any fingerprints found on uh, this casing? Yes, the defendant's. Uh, Lieutenant, do you have an inventory of what was taken from Mrs. Westbrook's bedroom safe? Ah, uh, yes, we do. Several items of jewelry and an envelope containing a chemical formula for a cosmetic cream. But we found the jewelry in a mailbox down the street from the house. You mean the jewelry wasn't really stolen after all? No, it wasn't. And did you find the chemical formula too? No, we didn't. So the only thing that was stolen from Mrs. Westbrook's safe was the formula for her cosmetics cream? That is correct. Now, let's talk about the broken window in the living room. The window was broken, was it not? Yes, it was. Lieutenant, when you examined the area around the broken window, what did you observe? I discovered that there was a lot more broken glass on the windowsill outside than there was on the floor inside. Indicating what? Indicating that the window had been broken from the inside out. Meaning that whoever broke the window was already inside the house? That is correct, sir. At the time of the murder, were the servants still in the house? No, they had already returned to the gatehouse where they lived. So who was in the house? Mrs. Westbrook and the defendant, Mr. Westbrook. Your witness, Constable. Defense has no questions, Your Honor. Witness is dismissed. Your Honor, the people call Eric Corbell. Harry, why don't you say something? So far, there's nothing to say. And what did these arguments between the defendant and Mrs. Westbrook concern? Do you recall? Sometimes they were because he was jealous of other men, but mostly they were about money. What about money? He said that she owed him. He'd given her a fortune, and now he wanted his money back. Hmm. And what did Mrs. Westbrook say to that? She'd just laugh. Tell him he'd get his money over her dead body. Your witness, Counselor. Defense has no questions. It's impossible to put a specific dollar value on it, but conservatively speaking, I would say that the ingenue formula could be worth tens of millions of dollars. Was the defendant aware of the value of the formula, Dr. Shaw? He was at the board meeting when we first discussed it. I'm certain that he knew. Counselor, your witness. Your Honor, defense has no questions for the witness at this time. In that case, Your Honor, the people rest. Very well. Witness is dismissed. Counsel for the defense, you may call your first witness. Your Honor, uh, defense calls Harley Griswold. We ask the court's indulgence to treat Mr. Griswold as a hostile witness. The court will grant you a certain leeway, Mr. Mason. Hmm. Mr. Griswold, I'd like to direct your attention to the young lady in the second row of the spectator section. Have you ever seen her before? Yes, she came to my house the day before yesterday. And at that time, did she offer to sell you an incriminating photograph linking you to the murder of Alana Westbrook? She most certainly did not. She said she was a reporter from the National Informer and she wanted to interview me for a story on cafe society snobs. I threw her out. I can put the young lady on the witness stand if necessary. You can do what you want at your trial. I'm telling you the truth. What kind of car do you drive? 1961 Jaguar Mark II, 3.8 liter sedan, British racing green. Your vintage car was involved in an attempted vehicular homicide two nights ago, was it not? If you say so, it must be true. The left front fender of your car was severely damaged, was it not? Yes, it was. In fact, that car belonging to you is at Imperial Motors having that fender replaced. Is that not true? Yes, that's quite right. My Jaguar was stolen from its garage that evening. I found it the next morning, parked around the corner with just the damage you describe. You're telling us someone stole your car, smashed it up, and then returned it? Why would someone do that, sir? Well, I, I suppose someone uh, might be trying to implicate me in some way to uh, set me up 
in the language of the streets. Why didn't you report the theft and the damage to the police or to your insurance company? Well, every time I try to make a claim, they raise the rates. It's cheaper for me to pay for the repairs myself. Hmm. Now, we've heard testimony about the value of the Ingenue formula. Isn't it a fair assumption that whoever murdered Mrs. Westbrook and stole that formula would be interested in selling it? Yes, I suppose so. But if you're going to ask me about that telephone call from Zurich on my answering machine, I promise you I know nothing about it. You have no plans to travel to Zurich to meet with representatives of the Swiss cosmetics concern? No, I don't. And after Alana's murder, why did you fax your travel agent and order a one-way ticket to Zurich? I didn't. Mr. Griswold, this is the fax that your travel agent received. It indicates that it came from your home. I wasn't at home at that time. Somebody must be trying to impersonate me. The same someone who stole your car? Yes. The same someone who faxed a cosmetics company in Zurich and asked for an appointment in order to discuss vital business concerns? The same someone who's trying to frame me. Yes. Do you have an alibi for the night of the murder? Or for the night that your car was involved in that accident? I was at home. No, you weren't. You left Alana Westbrook's birthday party at 10 o'clock. But according to your houseboy, you didn't arrive home until 2 a.m. Now that's four hours. Four! Where were you during those four hours, Mr. Griswold? I'm not on trial here. I don't have to furnish an alibi. The witness will answer the question. Your Honor, this is a very, very personal matter. Didn't you kill Alana, Mr. Griswold? And when Lauren Kent confronted you with proof of your guilt, didn't you try to kill her also? No. Then where were you the night Alana was killed? Oh, for heaven's sake, Harley, tell them. He was with me. Order. Order. Madam, you will be seated and you will be quiet. I was with Mrs. Courtney. Witnesses? <laughs> really, Mr. Vex, there were no witnesses. You see, I'm not quite the impotent eunuch that people like to think. Dear Mr. Courtney has allowed me to spend as much time as I want with his lovely wife under the mistaken impression that all we do is gossip and have lunch. Well, thanks to you, my cover's blown. Pity. Still, it's rather nice to be out of the closet. Mr. Mason? Mr. Mason? Your Honor, defense requests a short recess. Court is in recess for 20 minutes. All right. Lawrence set us up. Find her. Mr. Collins, is it not true that you and Alana were lovers? Objection. Irrelevant. Overruled. Yes, we were lovers. And when her husband found out about us, he threatened to kill her. Your Honor, may we mark these photographs for identification as defendants next in order? Yes, they may be marked collectively as defendants exhibit C. Thank you. Now, Mr. Collins, you say you were Alana's lover. Yes. Will you identify these photographs, please, Mr. Collins? They're pictures of me with a friend of mine. 
a young female friend, and the nature of the friendship is quite clear. Now, Alana was given those photographs on her birthday, was she not? You argued with her over those photographs, did you not? Yes. She was upset. What was she going to do, Mr. Collins? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. To make certain she did nothing, you got rid of her. Objection. Defense is badgering his own witness and attempting to introduce speculation as to motive when there's not a shred of evidence linking Mr. Collins to this crime. Sustained. Mr. Mason, that is enough. Now, do you have any more questions for this witness? Just one, Your Honor. Mr. Collins, did you kill Alana Westbrook? No. Mr. Mellers? No further questions, Your Honor. Witness is dismissed. Court is in recess. One hour for lunch. All rise. Damn it. Why didn't you there? Just leave her alone. Leave her alone. I told you. Court. Court. Bailiff, separate those two men. I don't want to go out with you anymore. Now I'm going away. Can't you just accept oh, that's that? that's cute. Real cute. You are the lady. Now be mature. Hey, you're totally getting the wrong... <laughs> you okay, Miss Kemp? I am now. What you... Thanks, Eduardo. I want to testify, Perry. I want to tell him the truth. Whose truth, Arthur? Yours or the prosecution's? The truth. I loved Alana. I, I could never have killed her. You were never angry at her? Oh, we had our disagreements, but... Because she was seeing another man. Scott Collins never mattered to her. She left him a small fortune from money you gave her. Well, it was her business. But your money, you must have hated her. No. But she betrayed you, made you look like a fool. Damn it, no. No, she didn't betray you or no, you weren't a fool. Just shut up. Will you shut up? Now, that's why I won't let you testify. I'm sorry, Arthur. I know you didn't enjoy that, but I had to make you understand. The prosecution will play on your temper and make you look like a man out of control, capable of any crime, the least of which is murder. My God, Barry, what are we going to do? Hey, I thought I told you to take a hike. Now we're even. God caught you. Listen, I thought you should know your boyfriend was up in your apartment. I don't know what he was looking for. I do. Thanks, Eduardo. Operator, I need to make another call using my credit card. The number I'm calling is 303-555-555-4128. Thank you. Yeah, it's me. We got trouble. I think that Laurie Melansky's going to follow me here. Here, Porterville. I don't know. I think he broke into my apartment, and I'm sure he found something that's going to lead him down here. Well, I'm headed back to the house right now, but I'm afraid he's going to follow me there. 
Yeah, I can do that. What road is that? Yeah, I can do that too. Now, I'll make sure he's behind me when I get there. from Denver. Guess you get a lot of cars pulling in here running on empty, huh? A friend of mine was driving up this way. I was wondering maybe if she filled up here. Tall blonde lady, good looking. Did you see her? Guess not. You take credit cards? Great. You got a restroom? Great. Why don't you pop the hood and check the oil? My name's Molansky. I'm an attorney working on a murder case, and this lady, Lauren Kent, is a crucial witness. I need to find her. Now, she was here. You must have seen her. A tall, blonde, good-looking lady. In a town like this, she'd be hard to miss. Really? All right, I'll tell you what. You tell me where she is, and I'll make it worth your while. 20 bucks. Now, where is she? 20 bucks with gas and oil. I ain't seen no woman. Great. Anybody ever tell you you talk too much? 20 bucks, I gotta get somewhere. WJ, watch the shop. I'll be back in a few minutes. Is this some kind of game to you?
Perry. Ken, I can barely hear you. Where are you? Porterville. Where's Arthur? He said he was going home. Why? Perry, listen. Lauren Kent was shot and killed this afternoon. The Porterville police did a complete ballistics test on the bullets they found, and they were definitely fired from the same gun that killed Alana Westbrook. I think Arthur killed them both. Ken, that just can't be so. Well, then where is he? It was his gun and his bullets, and he had a lot to gain getting Alana and Lauren out of the way. Perry, I just don't want you going out on a limb on this. Look, Ken, once I was your lawyer. I believed in you the way I believe in Arthur. Now do this for me, Ken. Ken, are you there? Yeah. Alana Westbrook was raised in Porterville. Find out where she lived, who remembers her when she was a child. Find out what relatives she has there. Get back to me as soon as... Perry? Ken? Ken? your house until 11 last night. Where were you? I panicked. I got in the car and just drove. I must have driven a couple hundred miles. Something wrong? Yes. Lauren Kent is dead. All rise. The Denver County Court is now in session. Judge Eleanor Harrelson presiding. Be seated. You may call your first witness, Mr. Mason. Uh, may I have a moment, Your Honor? Very well. Lauren's dead. She was murdered. We're waiting for more news from Ken. Where is he? I'm not sure. What's he doing? I'm not sure of that either. Lauren betrayed you, Arthur. I just hope Ken found something to... Mr. Mason. Uh, Your Honor, some new evidence has been found. I'd like to recall Dr. William Shaw, but I'd also like to take a short time to go over this evidence. Court will be in recess 15 minutes. That short enough, Mr. Mason? I don't know why you're asking me these questions. I had no reason to kill Alana. You and Alana Westbrook developed the Ingenue formula together, is that right? To be honest, Alana dealt with marketing and public relations. I developed the formula. We started 20 years ago when we worked together in Europe. And Mrs. Westbrook used herself as a guinea pig for Ingenue under your guidance, is that true? Yes. How long had she used the formula, Doctor? I believe she had used an experimental version for quite some time. Dr. Shell. How old was Alana Westbrook? I don't know. Now, I gave you two envelopes. Would you look into envelope number one, please? Now, that is the birth certificate Alana Westbrook showed to the press to prove she was 62. Do you recognize it? Yes. Now, envelope number two, please. That is another birth certificate, one which was found in the house of a woman named Lauren Kent. To whom does it belong? Alana Westbrook. According to the birth date on that certificate, how old was Alana Westbrook when she died? Forty. How old? Forty. And Ingenue never changed her appearance, did it, Doctor? Her appearance was always miraculous, wasn't it? She was very beautiful, yes. And you... You were in love with her. Mr. Mason. 
Yes, I loved her. Dr. Shelm, if Alana was only 40 and the face cream had not changed her appearance, then the whole thing was a charade, almost fraudulent. No, it was not a fraud. The cream just wasn't ready yet. Alana said that she could no longer afford to wait for us. She was deeply in debt. So, Lauren Kent planted that counterfeit birth certificate and those false records. That was Lauren's idea and Alana's. They said it would take the public years to realize that Ingenue didn't work. I tried to stop them. You see, Mr. Mason, <laughs> the cream really was great. The formula was almost ready. Germany, Dr. Schell, Germany. Isn't it true your father changed your family name when he and your mother moved out of Germany? Our name used to be Schellenberg. Your grandfather, Gustav Schellenberg, was a renowned marksman. He passed that skill on to your father, who then taught it to you, isn't that correct? As a matter of fact, you were a greater marksman than Arthur Westbrook. I was considered by some to be an expert marksman, yes. Your Honor, I'm momentarily through with this witness, but I reserve the right to recall him. I now call W.J. Cronkite to the stand. Mr. Cronkite, you were the one who helped Mr. Melansky find his way to Lauren Kent's house that first time, is that correct? Yes. You also helped him find all the evidence he just brought into court. Yes, I did that, and uh, I sure hope it wasn't against the law. Oh, I think you're in the clear. Now, Mr. Cronkite, you also overheard a long-distance telephone call made by Lauren Kent at the Porterville gas station. Could you tell us about that? Well, I, I don't remember at all, but... Uh, she said she was going to make sure that Melansky followed her up some road in his car. And that he was going to be right behind her when she got there. She sounded like something bad was going to happen. You know who she was calling? No, I don't know that. But I remember the number. Uh, our phone's in terrible shape. It's kind of old. And she had to get a hold of the operator to get her call. I uh, jotted down the number. I, I got it right here. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like that telephone number introduced as Defense Exhibit D. Thank you, Mr. Cronkite. You've been very helpful. I now recall Dr. William Shell. Dr. Shell. Defense Exhibit D is a telephone number called by Lauren Kent from the Porterville service station. Now, that number, 303-555-4128, is your telephone number, is it not? Yes. So, it had to be you that directed Lauren Kent to drive up that mountain road, to be followed by Ken Melansky. Yes. Only you had the knowledge that they were on that road, and you are an excellent marksman, Dr. Shell. She betrayed you, both you and Alana. You couldn't let her get away with that, could you? Is that why you killed her? She deserved it. The woman you loved. Did she deserve to be killed? We were happy in Switzerland. I was in love with her. I would have done anything for her, anything. I created the formula for her. Ambitious. She was so ambitious. She left me, went to the United States, and married him. I was never the same, Mr. Mason. I was devastated. When she called, asked me to be her chief chemist. I couldn't say no. I could never say no. I couldn't say no to being with her. And then she stole the formula. 
I was never to see her again. Can you imagine? I would have given her anything. She didn't need to do that. I loved her. I still do. But you killed her. Mr. Mason? Yes, I did. I killed her. Your Honor? The people have no objection to a dismissal of all charges, Your Honor. So ordered. Bailiffs, place Dr. Shell under arrest. Court is adjourned. Congratulations. her so much and it's funny how things can change she wasn't a very good person was she maybe i'm not much better you know Perry, you can't imagine what it means to me that you stuck by me that's what old friends are for yeah old friends Fifth one in less than an hour. Reminds me of a day in the Columbia with my grandfather. Fish were jumping into the boat. Uh, you know, it's a shame Della hasn't caught anything yet. Last time she won the tournament, and today she can't even get a bite. We're just better fishermen. Don't you think so, Della? I think if you'd untie my hands, things would be different. No, oh, ma'am. We like things just the way they are. <laughs> Whoa, got another one. So do I. When we get back to shore, you're both doomed. Sheila. Sheila. Who's there? Officer Bates, it was hanging right there. All right, so so you saw this mannequin in the dark. Now, right. You, you, you didn't turn the lights on. I didn't have to. You don't believe me, right? Well, I'm sure you saw what you saw. Hysterical woman. Hmm? Delusional talk show host. Ma'am, this isn't the first call we've had from you. Thank you, officer. Thanks for coming. I wish I could be of more help. I'm sure. Good night.
Mason. What is it, Della? Yeah, I know she's an old friend of yours. Oh? I'll come right over. Della, please stop apologizing. I was getting up in another three hours anyway. Ken, glad I caught you at home. Guess what? I've heard your show on KCDM, usually a little later in the morning. Somebody trying to gaslight you, Dr. Carlin? It appears so. First it was just uh, phone calls, hang-ups, uh, someone uh, prowling around outside. When did all this begin? About a month ago. Thanks, Dylan. Did anybody else have a key to your house? No, but it wouldn't matter anyway, because I had the alarm on. I mean, uh, how could anybody get the code? Does the security company send your bills here or to the station? To my office at the station. Anyone at the station who might have done these things? Well, if, if I had to pick somebody, it would be Winslow Keane. I mean, ever since uh, he bought the station, he's been trying to break my contract. <laughs> I wouldn't put this past him. Ken... Get in touch with Lou McIntyre first thing in the morning. We need a full security analysis of the house. We need to change all the locks. And tell him to put a monitor on the phone so we can tape any phone calls. Della, we'll wait two days, then we'll need a new unlisted telephone number. Now, Sheila, I'd like an excuse to meet Winslow Keene and a chance to observe everybody at the station. I think I can arrange that. KCDM, Talk Radio. And now back to Fritz and Fred. Okay, my twisted legions, don't everybody call at once, even though we're raffling off a date with Fred's girlfriend this morning. So here's the issue. The girlfriends of radio personalities and the listeners who want them. Is the caller there? Uh, this is Steve, Fritz. Steve, my man. How much do you bid, Steve? Well, what's Fred's girl like? Ooh. All right, she's hot, she's good looking. She won't shut up, but just do what I do. You put a bag over her head. If I could interject here, Steve, she's a two-bagger, definitely. That's right. You use two bags in case one breaks. Uh, but we'll give them the choice of paper or plastic. Thank you. Good morning, USA. This is Red, White, and Baby Blue Clock Hunter. And I'm ready to straighten out you and the country if you've got the guts to call me. Clark, you get a double salute from me on how you spoke out on that gun issue last week. Friend, I don't back out, back down, or back off. What's your question? How do you feel about all these women who expect to get top jobs whether they earn them or not? Here's what I have to say to these women. Listen to the real women's national anthem. I vote and the clouds on air do I enjoy being a girl. You know what really ticks me off, Boomer? Oh, what's that, Bruce? All these guys, they make all this money playing football, you know, and then, and then like they don't play and say they're injured or something. How do you know they're really hurt, you know? Oh, come on, look, from, from Pop Warner to college football to the pros, over a million people a year get hurt playing football, and, and every pro is playing a little hurt to some extent. And I'll tell you what, if I, Boomer Kelly, hadn't been hurt, I'd still be out there making the big bucks rather than spending my lunch hour in here talking to people like you, huh? Good afternoon. In Tinseltown today, Maura Shears, star of the hit movie Vampire Love 2, was spotted shopping for clothes at Trendy Maternity. Are we expecting? And if so, who's the daddy? This is Judith Jansen. You're on the air. Hi, this is Debbie. Hi, Debbie. What's your question? For the past hour this afternoon, we've had the considerable pleasure of interviewing the eminent defense lawyer, Perry Mason. Before our time is up, Mr. Mason, I'd like to pose a legal question of my own. That is, if you will indulge me. Depends on the question. A man shoots his victim in the head. The victim survives, but is on life support. Two years later, the victim's family and physicians agree he's brain dead. They pull the plug. The victim dies. Now, my question is, is the man who shot him guilty of murder or attempted murder? That's a good question. I would hope so. In most states, if the victim dies more than a year and a day after the shooting, 
The proper charge is attempted murder. However, most prosecutors would disagree. The case would certainly cause controversy. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Mr. Mason. Until tomorrow, everyone, this is Winslow Keen. Now stay tuned for Dr. Sheila Carlin, coming right up after these messages. Well, I think that went very well, Mr. Mason. Yes, the law is always worth discussing. I enjoyed that part. Mm -hmm. ah, now here is the uh, woman who persuaded me to have you on my show. Doctor, the studio is yours. I'll be with you shortly, Mr. Mason. You'll excuse me, I've called a staff meeting. You'll be hearing about it. Are you aware that Dr. Carlin has had some disturbing occurrences at her home during the last month? I've heard about them. Probably someone who actually took her advice and lived to regret it. Any idea who that might be? No, but if I find out, I'll let you know. Good, Mr. Keene. Whoever it is, they will live to regret it. Goodbye, Mr. Mason. I'm making some significant changes. All right, Winslow. You've had your little moment of drama. Now, what's this all about? There's been a steady decline in revenue for the past six months, so I'm changing the station's format. Beginning Monday, KCDM will be playing music during the day, and you'll all be working at night. What? Oh, come on. Yes, Fritz and Fred, the bad boys of radio, will be dispensing their tastelessness from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. What? There is no way. Our morning drive time gets the highest ratings in this city. Nobody listens to KCDM at night. Hey, man, we've got an offer from L.A. We're going. <laughs> Believe me, you two aren't going anywhere. And you, Judith? You'll be purveying your mindless gossip from 10.30 a.m. to 11 a.m., from 3.30 p.m. to 4 p.m., and 11.30 p.m. to midnight. Live. Well, that's a 14-hour day. I couldn't possibly work those hours. Pity. And you, you'll be mispronouncing the names of Major League Cities from 4 a.m. to 5 a.m. You can't do this to me. Let's face it, Boomer, I just did. You're a charity case. What other station in town will hire you? And you, my pseudo-intellectual friend, will wrap yourself in the flag from 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. I see how this works. You're saving the best hours for yourself. Well, that's true. Well, I'm calling my lawyer. <laughs> and the first thing I'll ask you is how you intend to pay him when I cancel your contract. Your contract stipulates you can't work anywhere else for the next 27 months. Well, we'll just see about that. And when Dr. Carlin gets off the air, you can tell her she's going on the air from midnight to 3 a.m. Anyone still up at that hour deserves her one-minute psychiatric evaluation. See you later, bad boys. This is Dr. Sheila Carlin inviting you to share your problems with me. And together we will find the solutions that can empower you and change your life. Until tomorrow. Oh. Jack, you did it again. See you tomorrow, Doc. Okay. Judith, why are you still here? I just wanted to see your face when I gave you the news. Wait a minute. Wait, wait just a second. I don't care who owns this station. You cannot do this to my show. But I can, and I will. But I won't let you treat me this way. You know what I like most about you, Dr. Carlin, is, is how seriously you take yourself. Oh. As if any of your psychobabble actually helps anybody. Will you shut up, Winslow? If you had any competence, your own daughter would still be alive. Read the fine print, Doctor. I own the station. I own your contract. And I own you. Excuse me.
Hey, Phil. Hey, Boomer. Good. Who do you like on Sunday? And the cheerleaders, huh? <laughs> Chris Stanley. Out here, Boomer. Back room for you and your friends. Great, great. Thanks, Nate. Ah, oh, shabby chic. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa's murder was planned here, you know. Oh, really? By whom? This is Mr. Farnsworth. I'll see you're not disturbed. So what do you nice folks have in mind? I'm sorry to say that Keen is right, Sheila. Under the terms of this contract, you're tied to the station for the next three years. Well, I wish you'd been my lawyer then, Perry. Well, I wouldn't have let you sign these. How could I let myself in for this? Don't be so hard on yourself, Sheila. You just lost your daughter. Your husband was divorcing you, and you, you weren't thinking clearly. I wasn't thinking at all. I've counseled people whose children have died of a drug overdose. When it's your own daughter, it, it's, it's different. I did blame myself. And then when Tom blamed me too, I... I was lost. You certainly had good reason to be lost. Perry, considering the stress I was under, is this contract valid? I'm afraid it is, my dear. Sheila? I wish we could have been more help. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Nothing we can do? Nope. Not this time. Turner? You out? Yeah. Let's go. You said 15. That's no discount. 12. Okay. Wallace? Drive carefully. <laughs> yes. Don't worry. Consider it done. Just leave it out there by the door. I'm sorry, but I, I need your signature. I'm sorry, sir, but I need your signature for these. Come on in. Thank you. Who, uh, who sent this? They're from someone who wants you to get everything you deserve.
Dr. Sheila Carlin, you're on the air. Listen carefully. I can only say that I'm stunned at both your lack of compassion and your stupidity. And furthermore, your audacity in referring to what you do as constructive. When any fool could see that... Winslow? Winslow? Oh, my God. Who's in charge here? Over there. Lieutenant Brock. Lieutenant Brock, hello. I'm, I'm Dr. Sheila Carlin. I was on the air with Mr. Kane when this happened, and I got here as soon as I could. Who did this? Well, that's what we're trying to find out, uh, Doctor. Dr. Carlin, what kind of a car do you drive? A Jaguar. Mm -hmm. Why? And your license plate, what, what does it uh, read? Shrink. <laughs> it's my daughter's idea. And you're on the air. Are you on the air every night, ma'am? Mm -hmm. Midnight to three. And while you're on the air, do you, Dr. Carlin, yes. while you're on the air, do you answer your own telephone calls? Well, I, I don't have an engineer at that hour, so I do handle it myself. Uh -huh. Why? May I ask, where were you earlier this evening? That is before you went to work. I was, uh, I was at home. Mm -hmm. Alone. Yes, alone. Why? At approximately 1.15 this morning, while you were on the air, you apparently talked with Winslow Keene, am I correct? Yes, I, I said that. I, I, he called me to rant at me, and uh, I heard the gunshot. I called 911. I got here as soon Listen as I... Listen, ma'am. You called 911. Our first unit arrived here at 1.20. The medical examiner placed Mr. King's death at approximately 10 p.m. Now, you see where I'm going with this, ma'am? He was already dead when he called you. But that's... that's not possible. I think you better come downtown with me, ma'am. What? To police headquarters. Do you have an attorney? Can we go now? I'm afraid not yet. What? Dr. Carlin, do you recognize this tape recorder and tape? No. Why? We found it in your home. My home? We believe, ma'am, that at approximately 10 p.m., you shot and killed Winslow Keene. And then at 1.15 a.m., while you were on the air, you answered a call from Mr. Keene. It was Winslow Keene. The whole audience heard him. We believe you manufactured that call from a Winslow Keene broadcast, which, of course, would give you the perfect alibi. And we have here an automatic dialer programmed to call the station and to play the tape, which we found in our house, Mr. Mason. Listen carefully. I can only say that I'm stunned at both your lack of compassion and your stupidity. And furthermore... Dr. Carlin... Dr. Carlin, I am placing you under arrest for the murder of Winslow Keene. Lieutenant, I need some time with Dr. Carlin. Use my office, Mr. Mason. I swear to you, Perry, I don't know anything about this. Does anyone have access to your car? No. It must have been a car that was made to look like mine. Is that all they have on me? No, there's more. Lieutenant Brock's men found the murder weapon hidden in your basement. I didn't kill him, Perry. I hated the man, but I didn't do it. I know it looks bad. I... I'm being framed. I'm certain of it. One thing we can be certain of. It isn't Winslow Keene. What is that? That is a new herbal tea. Cypress. That's a tree. It was. This is going to relax you. I am relaxed. Well, this will make you more relaxed. You know a lot about witchcraft. <laughs> uh, 
I'm on my way to see Sheila. From her, get the names and backgrounds of all persons at the station who might have had a reason to kill Keene. He was evidently making drastic changes. Evidently. Hello, Della. Have some tea. Goodbye, Della. Smells like tree bark. It is. What'd you find? The murder weapon was a cold gun. No serial numbers, untraceable. Anybody could have bought it. I can check out some very shady types I know. You do that. I'll be careful. You be careful. Looking for something cold. I'll introduce you to my wife. I've got references. Willie Castile, Steve Roma, Max Taylor. Okay. Take your pick, my friend. Looking for a desert eagle. I'll pay top dollar. Too bad you weren't here two days ago. I had one, but I sold it, but not for top dollar. Yeah, I got the locker key. Right? I'm checking out now. No, don't call me. I'll call you. Right. I'm an attorney. I just want to talk to you. Open the door. Open the door. Please, it's okay. I'll call the police. 
So there's nothing you or anybody else can tell me. These guys are in. Okay. All right, the security guards didn't get a good look at this guy. Is there anything that you can tell me about him? Uh, I didn't get a good look at him either. But he's the man who killed Winslow Keene. Well, isn't that interesting when all of our evidence indicates that Dr. Sheila Carlin did it? The gun that killed Keene was the Desert Eagle. Very unusual. The man who attacked Ken tonight bought one two days ago. Ken trailed the guy, backed him into a corner. Don't forget, the guy robbed him. The guy we're chasing after bought the gun from a guy named Wallace. He runs the 8th Avenue pool hall. Oh, I know him. I'll talk to him, but he's not going to cop to anything. Lieutenant, you want to take a look at this? Looks like about $100,000. Uh huh. So that's why you're trying to get to that locket. That's where he kept his stash. I don't want a round the clock stake out in this place. When he comes back for the cash, that's when we'll nail him. When you do, Lieutenant, we'll have our killer. <laughs> I can't go back there. They're going to have cops all over the warehouse. I know they're not going to be there forever, but I can't wait. You're going to have to get me more money. No, no, wait. Hey, you understand. This was your party. You're paying for it. Winslow Keene should have fired his gardener. Why don't I check around outside? Good idea. Good morning, Miss Jansen. Who are you? Name's Mason. I represent Sheila Carlin. What are you doing here? Oh, I'm looking for my glasses. Of course you are. Well, I came to visit Winslow a few days ago, and I just left my glasses. Now that he's dead, you're still looking for them. Oh, well, Winslow can't now, can he? Wasn't your visit with him the other day to discuss getting out of your contract? Well, uh, yes, it was. Look, I know how you operate, Mr. Mason, but I do have an alibi for the time of the murder. The person responsible for Keene's death doesn't need an alibi. It was a murder for hire. A hitman? Sounds colorful. So is what well-known radio gossip is being investigated by the FCC. Who told you that? Seems Keen informed the FCC that you had accepted cash for mentioning certain celebrities' products on your program. Well, that has never been proven. Oh, but if it is, you could face a jail sentence. Your career would be over. What exactly is your point, Mr. Mason? That you also had a motive for murder. That can't be proven either. Ah, my glasses... He would have thought Winslow would have had the decency to return them himself. Well, he can't now, can he? Uh, two nights before Winslow Keene died, you and four of your colleagues had a private meeting at a certain restaurant. Special occasion? It was just social. Why wasn't Sheila Carlin invited? Frankly, she's not that popular. Terrible temper, you know. Good luck with your case, Mr. Mason. No. Good luck with yours. That is a subpoena. We'll be delighted to see you in court. Hi. Who are you? My name's Smolansky. I'm a lawyer. Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. It's not a good idea to startle me. Heard you coming, Bigfoot. I'm a cop. You're investigating Winslow Keene's murder? Not much to investigate. We got enough on Sheila Carlin to convict her twice. Except that Dr. Carlin didn't do it. Yeah, that's what you say. That's what I know. Well, there's no evidence here, but uh, look around. It'll keep you out of mischief. Find something? Just a cop with an attitude. What can I do for you? My name's Mason. My name's Molansky. We're representing Dr. Sheila Carlin. 
Oh, yeah. The shrink who popped that little guy. What's his name? Keen. Winslow Keen. Yeah, that one. I can't help you. I never saw either one in here. Boomer Kelly is a regular, isn't he? Yeah. Why? Mr. Kelly had a dinner party here last week. In the back room, all six of them. Kelly, Hunter, Moore, Fisher, and Jansen, that makes five. You did say six. One guy came late. Who was that? I don't know. Maybe you should ask Mr. Scanlon. Fred, I can't help you. I wasn't here that night. This gentleman seems to think that you were here. Don't you remember? I was home with the flu. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's the matter with me? He's right. I'm sure he's always right. If you happen to remember the name of man number six, give us a call. Good luck with the case. No, good luck to you, Mr. Scanlon. That's a subpoena. I'd really like to know who man number six was. Well, they're not going to tell us. Heard from your gun dealer? He's ducking my calls, but he's usually there on Friday nights counting his receipts. Huh. Let's hope he's had a good week. And that guy you sold the Desert Eagle to, has he been back here? I never should have talked to you in the first place. Now let me at it. That gun killed Winslow Keen. Now if that guy calls here, you're going to call me. What's that? Expecting anyone? Uh-uh. Get back. The guy who sold the gun to Keene's murderer. Yeah, well, for all I know, he's just the guy you play pool with. What were you doing following me? Look at it this way. If you are chasing a killer, you're going to need me. Because, baby, I had you cold in that pool hall without breaking a sweat. You do the legwork, and I'll take care of the bad guys. Oh, no. No, 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 no. You and I are not going to be buddies. See you around, lawyer. talking to you. Look, this guy called again. He says he wants another piece. Well, he knows you can identify him. You better stay clear of him. Look, if, if I give you a name, it's worth something, right? Because I gotta get $10,000 to get lost. If it's the right name. Look, meet me in the pool hall in 30 minutes and bring the money. Wait a second, that's not a good idea. order a lawyer? Did you order a lawyer, friend? Sure. Extra large. To go. Oh, would you hand me that right here? Another stunt? Stunt? What stunt? We like girls. No, you're you're right, Mr. Mason. We're, uh, we're giving away a harem. Thirty girls. Count them. Thirty. What can we do for you? Mr. Keene forced you into accepting an unfavorable time period for your radio show. Did that make you angry? Us? <laughs> angry? Going from drive time to dead time, why should we be upset? Your dinner at Scanlon's bar, you used it to discuss what to do about Keene? Nah, we were just hungry. Actually, it was a wine tasting. With three people you didn't like? 
Hey, we like everybody. Even you. But especially her. Yes. She could be a great companion. Now, I've been through Keen's files. He had signed contracts with everyone but the two of you. Now, why was that? Sloppy management. Or was it because he didn't need contracts? Did he threaten you with a certain videotape? A videotape of the two of you and several underage ladies? <laughs> what a great rumor. How many were there? Shut up, Fred. Look, there have been, uh, there have been groupies that throw... Keen them... was blackmailing you into staying with the station, wasn't he? Where'd you get that? What do you want from us? The name of man number six at that dinner? There were only five of us there. Consider this a gift. A video cassette and two subpoenas. Two. Perhaps I can jog your memory in court. Good night, Doc. Look at this. The Three Stooges go to Mars. following me. I just hit a dead end. And by practicing what I preach, I hope that I can demonstrate that even the most negative situation can be a, an opportunity for personal growth. Um, I'm confident that you will always support me. Um, well, I'm ready to hear from you. You're on the air. Hello, Mr. Kelly. You're Sheila Carlin's lawyer, right? That's right. She's got a lot of nerve. You know, she uh, murders Winslow Keene, then comes right back in here and does her own radio show. You didn't like the changes Winslow Keene made here at the station, did you, Mr. Kelly? Nobody did. 
In the history of your professional problems, you also had a history with Mr. Keene. I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Mason. I heard that Winslow Keene was directly responsible for the end of your football career. In a restaurant five years ago, he approached you after a game you lost. You didn't like what he said about your performance. Look, I I've heard this before. It sounds like a broken record, and it's all nonsense. You hit him, knocked out his front teeth. Later, two men you couldn't or wouldn't identify caught you in a parking lot and broke your knees. Look, if Winslow Keene had done this to me, then why would he give me my own show? Maybe Mr. Keene liked owning you. Uh, owning me? Wait, owning me? Nobody owns me. That's why you put together that gathering at Scanlon's restaurant, right? To make sure nobody owns you? Look, I didn't do anything wrong, so you just stay away from me, okay? Is that a warning? No, that's my advice. Mr. Kelly, you had two very good reasons to hate Winslow Keene. For most killers, one is enough. Go on, Kent. She recognized the hitman's girlfriend, Dan. Kathy said they grew up in the same neighborhood together. The girlfriend's name is Doris Lester. She's a prostitute. Try it, Perry. Hot, um, hot, uh... That's a very special tea. It's called Mystical Mixture. Let me know how you feel in an hour. I see Della's still trying to improve you. It's been a lot of years, but she never gives up. <clears throat> How about our other suspects? Well, I haven't talked to Mr. Hunter yet, but it could have been any one of them. What about that mysterious man number six? I'm not sure he had or has anything to do with the murder. You think they all got together and hired a hitman? I wouldn't rule it out. Kathy Paxton certainly has an interesting idea for catching our hitman. She's going undercover. Lieutenant Brock told me she's a very capable officer. Yeah, a real dynamo. Ken, for some of us, taking direction from a woman is a new experience. You've always handled it beautifully, Perry. Yes, haven't I? Well, where did the department get this car? From a pimp. Where else? <laughs> I think you're right. If your old friend Doris is a prostitute, most likely the man with her is her pimp. Yeah, and our shooter. So how well did you know Doris, anyway? Eh, well enough. Her parents were drunks, and uh, her father had a thing for her. I didn't give her a break. She didn't give herself one, either. Oh, hey, there's Doris Pullova. Goes doors with the John. Well, let's hope that's a quick romance. Evening, ladies. Look, this corner's taken. Oh, honey, I don't work on a corner no more. Used to. So my man over there set me up in high style at the Taylor Arms. Well, then what are you doing here? <laughs> Making you an offer. 50-50 split with the man. Medical care and security on the premises. And none of my man's girls get knocked around. <laughs> huh? Yeah, well, we already got us a man looking after us. Yeah, and he wouldn't like us talking to you. So why don't you take a hike? <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? what? My man doesn't take no for an answer. Uh -huh. You're gonna like working for him. Hey, look, we don't want any trouble, Then don't okay? give me any. Okay. Why don't you get lost? Be uh, lost, sweetie. We're gonna be friends. That's Clark. You can't ban books because they disagree with your politics. What about the First Amendment? Just what I'd expect from a limp whip like you, Junior. Upholding some subversive's right to promote treason under the guise of self-expression. Your history, pal. And for the rest of you late-night Bolsheviks out there, 
Here's a medley of John Philip Sousa. Decent people sleep at night. Well, I get a cranks. People who don't agree with you. I call them the way I see them. You didn't just drop by to tell me you like my show. What can I do for you? No one present at the wine tasting at Scanlon seems to remember more than five people being there, do you? Matter of fact, I don't. How did you enjoy the wine? Why do you ask? Well, you are a reformed alcoholic. So? So, why were you there that night? Were you planning Mr. Keene's future? Winslow was a twerp. Why would I kill him? You still married Mr. Hunter? No. I'm divorced. I understand your wife is very beautiful and a very talented actress. You were considered a perfect couple. I don't care to discuss this. Do you mind telling me the reason for your divorce? That's none of your business. Three years ago, you discovered your wife was having an affair. Who told you that? The man who broke up your marriage was Winslow Keene. You threatened to kill him. But I didn't, did I, Mr. Mason? Life goes on. I got over it. No, you didn't, Mr. Hunter. No, you didn't. Why, you're still fighting the Cold War. Where'd she go? Hey. You're gonna love this place, baby. Wall to wall view. I was just doing what the man told me, you know? Yeah. That's funny. Because I'm having a hard time believing that you are a working girl. Well, I'm not. I mean, you know, I wasn't. It just... Look, I got laid off a year ago, and I couldn't make my rent, you know? You heard it before. Yeah, I've heard it before. Many times. Look, I don't care who I work for. You know, the guy was just there, and I needed protection. Hey, look, I'll work for you if you treat me decent. You'll work for me, all right. As soon as I teach you my way. Lesson number one is discipline. Mm. <clears throat> I will be back. Harry, here. Let me guess. Saltwater crocodile. No, it's made from pine cone and it's good for the mine. Try it. It's awful. It's Chinese. Northern or Southern? Northern. It's Northern Chinese and it's awful. <coughs> Sheila Carlin leave for court? I just spoke to her. She said she'd meet us there. Brock brought in all the hookers and talked to them. But they won't help. Why don't you wait in here in case she calls? Yeah. Ken, it's not your fault. Thanks, Perry. I wish I could believe that. Believe it.
Hey. I fell asleep waiting for you. You have a big night? Just one. But he liked me. Not bad. So I heard you had some trouble last night? Yeah. We got a new girl. Oh. Downstairs. In the basement? Sensory deprivation. to roust our quota of hookers. So let me go and, and I'll forget this ever happened. This is no vice thing. Hey, why would I lie? That's a good question. Come here. Let's come on. Okay. We gotta get out of here. But she's gonna look at hey, us. listen. I think she's been looking for me. And now she's made me. Look. I'll be back in an hour. You pack up. Indoors? Let's get rid of her. Hey, I never said Hey, hey. Hey, baby. Come on now. Come on. I want us to be in this together. Okay. And this handgun, which has previously been identified the murder weapon was found where in the basement of the defendant's home lieutenant i now show you an audio tape cassette mark people's exhibit number two and ask if you can identify it yes it has my mark on it and it was found in the defendant's home or dr sheila carlin what can you tell us about this tape lieutenant it's an edited tape of a winslow king broadcast have you compared it with the transcript of a telephone call made to Dr. Carlin on her show the night of the murder? Yes, I have. That's Mr. Kane's half of the conversation. Could this tape machine and automatic dialer found in Dr. Carlin's home have been programmed to call the station that night and play this tape, Lieutenant? Yes, I personally programmed a test call to the station using that tape. I also examined telephone company records, which indicated a call had been made from Miss Carlin's home to the station at 1.15 a.m. on the night of the murder. We previously had testimony that Mr. Keene's time of death was no later than 10.30 p.m., more than two hours earlier. <laughs> well, that is correct. The deceased couldn't have made the call. Then this tape and the call were just an attempt by the defendant to establish some kind of alibi. Objection. No foundation calls for improper opinion. Sustained. Nothing further. Thank you, Lieutenant. What was the name of that dog that used to follow you all over the neighborhood? Maxie, Moxie? Stop trying to pretend we were friends. We weren't ever friends. So we didn't hang out, but we knew each other. I knew what your father did to you. Shut up! Or what, you'll kill me twice? He can't even pull his own trigger, and you're ready to do life in prison for him? I'm not going to prison, okay? We're moving in on him, Doris. Get out before you go down with him. I can't. Oh, yeah, I forgot. He's your pimp. 
He uh, slaps you around. He takes your money. Why wouldn't you be loyal? You don't know anything. He loves me. Oh, yeah? Well, you better be crazy about him, Doris, because sooner or later you're going to die for him. It's a shame, too, because uh, I could cut you a deal. Mr. Strong, how long have you made deliveries for Morton Pharmacy? Um, about a year and a half. You've delivered prescriptions to Winslow Keene's house before the night in question? Uh, oh, yeah, many times. Will you tell us what you saw on your last delivery to Winslow Keene's house? Um, sure. Um, I went there, same as always, and uh, I rang the bell, and nobody answered. So I knocked, and he still didn't answer. So I figured, you know, maybe he went someplace. Did Mr. Keene usually wait at home for his prescription deliveries? Oh, yeah, always. See, uh, he took Digitalis, and so and he can never remember, you know, to call until he ran out. Um, and so he was always very anxious to get it. But on this night, he did not answer the door. No. Then what happened? Well, I decided to go back to the store and uh, to have the pharmacist call him. And uh, I was just about ready to pull away when this car comes barreling out of Winslow Keene's driveway and damn near hits me, you know, driving away. You got a good look at the car? Oh, yeah. Up close and personal. Will you describe it for us? Sure. Um, it's a green Jag, and it had a license plate that read shrink. You know, S-H-R-A-N-K. One of a kind, would you say? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, aren't all license plates one of a kind? I have no further questions. Mr. Mason? Mr. Armstrong, is there anything else you remember about the car? Um, no, sir, not really. Your Honor, Defense Exhibit B. Mr. Armstrong, we show you a photograph which depicts the rear of Dr. Carlin's Jaguar. Is that the car you saw? Yep. I mean, you know, there's the license plate, shrink. What else do you see? Um, a bumper sticker in support of protecting dolphins. Now, you stated you saw the license plate up close and personal, but you never mentioned that bumper sticker. Why not? Well, um, I guess I didn't see it. Your Honor, what is the point of this? Your Honor... Defense contends that whoever wanted to frame Sheila Carlin removed the license plate from her car and put it on another car, an identical Jaguar. But they overlooked the Save the Dolphins bumper sticker. Defense has no further need of this witness. Mr. Markham? I have no further questions. Witness is excused. Mr. Markham? Your Honor, the people rest... Mr. Mason, you may call your first witness. I call um, Nick Scanlon to the stand. Mr. Scanlon, on the night of the wine tasting arranged by Mr. Kelly, how many people were in attendance? I wouldn't know. Five, I guess. You don't know exactly? I wasn't feeling well, so I stayed home that night. You did not stop by your restaurant? Ask any of my employees. Oh, I have. I remind you that you are under oath and face the penalty of perjury. Now, I'll ask you once more. Were you at any time at your restaurant that evening? No. No? No further questions. Mary Mason's office. Where? Yeah, I got it. Who is this?
Kathy? I thought he was checking to make sure I was really dead. So what happened? I should have told Doris to kill me. Ah, but I turned her around. How'd you turn her around? <sighs> Come on, Boy Scout. Don't you know people in trouble are just looking for a way out? You gave her one. Ah, oh, yeah, but the first time in her life she actually took it. <sighs> she also gave me the name of our shooter. <sighs> Paul Turner. Lieutenant Brock couldn't find anyone under the name of Turner in their records that matches our guy. Did Brock, by any chance, send a fingerprint team to Doris's house? By chance, he did, but they didn't find any clear prints. Everything was smudged. Thank you. The Department of Water and Power, the gas company, the papers, none of them have a listing on Paul Turner. Was this woman lying? I don't think so. All you can do now is wait and hope that Doris will contact you. Where are you going? I'm going to see if I can find some oysters. You all like oysters? These oysters are excellent. Thank you. Do you want anything else? The name of man number six. I told you. I don't know. I wasn't here. Aren't you curious as to why I called you to be a witness? Your lawyers do strange things sometimes. True. But I wanted you to make a declaration under oath. What's this got to do with me? On the night of the alleged wine tasting, you placed a call on your private line from here to your brother in a Miami hospital. Here's a copy of your phone bill. Now, maybe now, you'd like to tell me about man number six. Where is he? Why the hell doesn't he call? Take it easy. Honey. Hey! Hey. Are you telling me what to do, huh? Are you? Uh, no, I'm just trying to be hopeful. <laughs> yeah. Why haven't you called, huh? I got cops looking for me. What? Well, you double crossing. Hey, don't. He hung up on me. He says that he can't get any more money. He says that Mason is on their case. He thinks he's going to get away with this. He's not. They may not get any more money, but I sure as hell can stop him from fingering me. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Doris. The hell with you too. Yeah. Put her through. Kathy, it's me, Doris. Are you okay? It's Turner. He's gone crazy. Where is he? I don't know. He's gonna go kill whoever hired him to kill Winslow King. Okay. Up. Turner's on his way to the courthouse.
Good afternoon, officer. Your Honor, I call Russell Farnsworth to the stand. State your name and occupation. Russell Farnsworth. I'm a private investigator. Mr. Farnsworth, on the night of the 10th, did you meet with five people in the back room of Scanlon's Oyster Bar? Yes, I did. Any of them in this courtroom? All of them. Would you point them out, please? Him? 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 And her. Will all of you please stand? Let the record show that Mr. Farnsworth has identified Fred Fisher, Fritz Moore, Boomer Kelly, Clark Hunter, and Judith Jensen. You may all sit down. Now, uh, who arranged this meeting? Mr. Kelly, there. The purpose? They offered me $50,000 to do what was ever necessary to get them out of their contracts with Winslow Keene. And you did that? No. I decided to grab the money and run. I mean, what are they going to do? Sue me? <laughs> uh, Winslow Keene was murdered two days after you took their money. Were you given a deadline to perform your services? 24 hours. So when you hadn't delivered on your promise, one of your employers could have made other arrangements. Objection. Speculation. Sustained. What did you do after your meeting? I went to the airport and flew to Vegas to find a missing husband. It took me three days, but I got him. And to prove I was there, I got receipts, airline ticket stubs, and a little cocktail waitress named Tiffany. Cost me a bundle. <laughs> no further questions. No questions. Witnesses excused. Thanks. Mr. Markham, permission to approach the bench? Granted. Your Honor, these five people had motive, opportunity, and the desire to inflict bodily harm on Winslow Keene. Your Honor, we still have the tape, the recorder, the automatic data, and the murder weapon. Mr. Markham, there were no fingerprints on any of those. Your Honor... They could have been planted by any or all of these people. This is pure supposition. I still move for a dismissal. Very well. I will take it under advisement. It would appear that these five people have conspired to commit bodily harm. We'll get into it. Take on! Ken, turn her! Immediately. The court is adjourned. You all right? Yeah. That man can't tell us anything. Maybe not. certainly was a case. Take a look at this. Any different issues of this magazine? No, but he has three copies of this one. Look, Perry, it's been a long night. This just about does it, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I'd say we just have time enough to clean up for court. I now call Clark Hunter to the stand. Mr. Hunter... 
Have you heard of the drug end abuse? Yes, I've heard of it. It was given to you during your treatment for alcohol abuse. Yes, it was. Doctors give it to patients to prevent them from drinking. What happens when a patient who's taking end abuse drinks alcohol? He gets sick. Only a fool would take end abuse and drink. And I am not a fool. You know Western Liquors on Brand Boulevard, do you not? Yes. Do you have a charge account there? Yes, I do. On the day of the murder, you ask Weston Liquors to deliver a particular bottle of Burgundy to your house, did you not? I often order wines for professional gifts. You knew that Burgundy was Miss Jansen's favorite and that she was having a dinner party that night? That's two questions. So it is. You knew that particular wine was Miss Jansen's favorite? No. Did you know that she was having a dinner party that night? No. On the day before Miss Jansen's dinner party, the one you did not know about, did you purchase a syringe from Morton's Pharmacy? I don't remember. If I showed you a copy of your pharmacy bill, would that refresh your memory? Okay, so what if I did? Before you sent the wine to Miss Jansen, didn't you dissolve end abuse tablets in a small bit of water and then inject it through the cork into the bottle? Absolutely not. On the day of the dinner, you left a package in Mr. Keene's office. Didn't you then call a messenger service to pick it up and deliver it to Miss Jansen's home? Of course not. Your Honor. I'm through with this witness, Your Honor. But I reserve the right to recall. Witness may step down. I now call Judith Jansen to the stand. Ms. Jansen, do you recognize that bottle? Yes, it's my favorite burgundy. On the night Mr. Keene was murdered, you canceled the dinner party that he was invited to, did you not? Yes, I did. Why? Well, I had some of this burgundy that afternoon, and it made me so ill that I ended up in the emergency room at Good Shepherd Hospital. Defense Exhibit G, Your Honor, the doctor's report from Good Shepherd Hospital. The diagnosis is toxic poisoning. Ms. Jansen, you're certain it was that burgundy that made you ill? Well, I hadn't had anything else to eat or drink since breakfast. Where did you get the wine? It was delivered by the Monarch Messenger Service from Winslow. It's my favorite burgundy. I couldn't resist trying it. I always have a little wine when I cook. Just... Thank you, Ms. Jansen. I have no further questions. This witness may step down. Defense recalls Clark Hunter. Knowing she would cancel her dinner, you deliberately tried to make Judith Jansen ill. No, I did not. Do you know who placed that recorder and automatic dialer in Sheila Carlin's house? No, I don't. I did not. But you did maneuver Winslow Keene to be alone at home where your, your hired assassin killed him. Mr. Hunter, you did that, did you not? Mr. Hunter, did you not? That's preposterous. Your Honor, Mr. Mason is persecuting me. He's using innuendo, lies, half-truths. I have rights. I know my rights. Your Honor, I consider Mr. Mason to be a very dangerous man. This court should be very careful with him. This court is here to protect your rights, Mr. Hunter. Please continue, Mr. Mason. Mr. Hunter, you're aware of the American Freedom Network, are you not? I'm aware of it. Understatement, sir. You sit on the board of that organization. In fact, you are the chairman of the board. That's why I'm aware of it. By the way, the man who was accidentally shot here yesterday, Paul Turner. You knew him, did you not? Of course I did not know him. The American Freedom Network also runs the survivalist camp, does it not? We provide the opportunity for Americans who love their country to prepare themselves to defend it. 
Isn't it true that for the past five years, Paul Turner was the head instructor at that camp? It's possible. And it's very possible that Turner broke into Dr. Carlin's house first to frighten her, then later to rig that recording machine? I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. I call your attention to Defense Exhibit K. Still photos taken from the surveillance cameras here in the courtroom yesterday during the shooting. Can you find yourself in those photos, Mr. Hunter? No. No. Of course not. You'll note that while everyone in the courtroom is looking at Mr. Turner, you were going out the side door, that side door. So what? So? You were the man he was looking for. You were his target. You were the only one who knew that. Your Honor, Defense Exhibit L, a sworn statement from Doris Lester, a friend of Mr. Turner's. Mr. Markham is the most literate man in this court today. I'd like to ask him to read the highlighted section for us. Uh, Your Honor, this is hardly... Mr. Markham. Well, uh, all right. Uh, <clears throat> Turner got a call from someone, someone he said hired him to kill a man named Keene. When he heard he wasn't getting his money, he took this gun out of the display case and went to the courthouse to shoot him. He said he'd kill him with the gun that man had given him. Your Honor, we'd like to enter into evidence Defense Exhibit Q, this display case from Paul Turner's apartment. It contained the sidearm of General George McAuliffe, a famous World War II general. Do you recognize it, Mr. Hunter? No, I don't. You should, Mr. Hunter. It contained the gun Mr. Turner brought into court, the gun you had given him. Here is the name of a gun store in Chicago. The store has a record of the purchase order signed by you, even has your fingerprints on it. Now, would you like to tell the truth? Your truth? Mr. Hunter. Bunzel Kane wanted to silence me. Keep me from telling the American people the truth. Would you speak up, sir? Winslow Kane wanted to silence me. Keep me from telling the American people the truth. I couldn't let him do that. And you had him killed. I did what I had to do. So, you are the dangerous man, Mr. Hunter. You are the dangerous man. Your Honor. Mr. Markham? People move for dismissal. Bailiff, take the witness into custody immediately. This case is dismissed and court is adjourned. Oh, thank you for being my friend. <laughs> no need. I'd like a rematch sometime. Oh. Mr. Markham, we're bound to meet again. Care to join us for lunch? He's fine. What a shame. Not today, thanks. Oh, Sheila, have you told Perry yet? I'm, uh, I'm starting a clinic for battered women and their children. Wonderful idea. We were talking about... We were talking about what I was going to do with the rest of my life. How can I ever repay you? 
You just did. Goodbye, P.M. P.M. Mm -hmm. P.M. Mm -hmm. Pre-med, post-mortem, past master. <laughs> past midnight. Yeah, past midnight. Uh. Oh, not another... No, this isn't tea. I made you a fresh pot of cocoa. Cocoa? Mm -hmm. Cocoa? I haven't had cocoa since I was a boy. So? So? Mm -hmm. I've been waiting a long time. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Inside Copy. Television's high-rated sitcom Josie is once again grabbing headlines due to the off-screen antics of its volatile star, Josie Joplin. This time, the explosive star is rumored to be divorcing her husband and co-star, Toby Joplin. Even though their popular show extols family values, their real-life marriage is Battle of the Stars. So far, Josie and Toby have refused to confirm or deny the rumors. But here at Inside Copy, we don't take no comment for an answer. We take you now to Kendall Moss Studios, where Josie Joplin is arriving now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are here today at Kendall Moss Studios, home of the popular sitcom Josie. And I believe that's her now. <laughs> Any truth in the rumor that you and your husband are breaking up? Is there trouble with your marriage? Is there trouble with your marriage? They will be no loser. Josie Joplin down the hall. Toby Actually, Joplin, 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 Sneaky slime ball. Hey, Josie. Hey, you can't come in no here. No girlfriend, huh? You liar. What's she? Are you sleeping with my husband? Get the girl. No, get the girl. Not... No, hey, leave me alone. This is all a mistake. Toby's just giving me notes for next week's script. That better be all he's giving you, honey, or you're dead. Now, what are you doing in here? You know you're not supposed to be out of here. Go on. Go on. Well, it looks like Josie Joplin has won this round, but if we know her, the fight is far from over. My client's offering you half a million, Mackenzie. It's a lot of money, Miss Pullman. Well, he's in a lot of trouble. Of course, the evidence against him is all circumstantial, but you never know which way a jury's gonna go. Well, in my experience, most juries go for the truth. Sure, if it's presented properly, but you've seen the headlines. Mega-rich software tycoon indicted for murder of business rival. Mega rich. You see the bias. Juries hate rich people. Ah, uh, you should have watched your step. Those were nice shoes. You can convince the jury he didn't do it. Make him see the man behind the money. Talk about his charity work. All he's done for the poor and the rich. Exactly. I've seen you in court, Mackenzie. Nobody works a jury like you. Kenzie. Oh, Iris, hello. I'm afraid I can't talk now. I'll call you back in 10 minutes? Thanks. You think I manipulate juries? In the most positive way. You're the best. You know the figure I quoted? Between us, I think you'll go higher. There's only one problem with your proposition, Counselor. What's that? Your client's guilty. I don't understand. Don't expect you to. Have a safe trip back to New York, Mr. Pullman. Too bad about your shoes. Iris Bill, what about... Slow down. What about Ivy? The what? What channel? You sneaky slime ball. Hey, Joe. All of them. Hey, you can't come in no here. No girlfriend, huh? You liar. What's she? Are you sleeping with my husband? Get the girl, no, get the girl. Of course I'm not. No, hey, leave me alone. This is all a mistake. Toby's just going to next week. What in the name of blue snakes you got yourself What into? are you doing in here? You know you're not supposed to be out of here. Go on, go away. Uh, yes, uh, Iris, I saw it. Now, darling, stop crying. Uh, don't worry, Iris. I'll go down there and bring her home. There's something else like the tickets. <laughs> 
Oh, I think that's everything. Now. We're all set. Yeah. Bella? Hi. Hi. Bill McKenzie. Bella, good to see you again. Hi, Harry. <laughs> you flying the coop again? Well, I, I'm joining Perry at The Hague in Netherlands. He's arguing a case in the world court. The world court? Boy, am I impressed. Mm -hmm. He can't do it without you, though, can he? So he says. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me, yeah. Janice. This is Bill McKenzie. Janice, my assistant. You remember? Oh, yeah. We talked on the phone. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you. You know, uh... You don't ever leave the ranch without there being a reason. There wouldn't be a problem now, would there? Well, it's my niece Ivy, a uh, mm. wonderful girl. I mm. helped my sister raise her when her yeah. daddy died. Yeah. Well, she got herself mixed up with some woman on television, Josie yeah. Joplin. Oh, your your niece is the Ivy West, who's having the with uh, Toby Joplin. Well, we don't know that for a fact, but uh, can't raise her on the phone, so I'm going over to the studio yes. and track her down. That show tapes this afternoon. Uh, I, I have a friend who's in the production company there. I'll, I'll ring up and I'll get you a ticket. Oh, good going, Janice. That Janice. You see, she'll be there anytime you need her, Bill. And, and Ken, he'll be here in the morning. Oh. I'm just sorry I can't help you, Bill. Oh, it's lovely to see you. I'm so late. I'm really late. Well, let me help you. Oh, here's, here's your coat. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Bella? Mm-hmm. Next time I'm in town, will you have dinner with me? It's a date. Safe trip. Bye, Bill. Ivy? Ivy? Uncle Bill! Hey, <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, uh, it's the only way I could get to you. You're not answering your phone. Oh, it's been really hectic. The show's in production. I I'm hardly ever home. After what I saw on the TV, I thought you might want to go home. Home? <gasps> you mean home? Well, yeah. Your mother thought you might want to finish college. That sounds like Mom. Uncle Bill, do you know how many college graduates come to L.A. hoping to land a job as a production assistant on a television show? No, I have laid awake nights on that. Thousands. But I got the job. I am not going home. You don't care what the TV and newspapers are saying about you. You mean the tabloids? You didn't take that seriously, did you? Are you involved with this married man? No. And if you don't believe me, you can ask him. Come on. I'll introduce him. Toby? <gasps> I forgot. He's in makeup. I'll get him. You mind waiting here? No, no. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> no, I'll have some uh, candy. <laughs> <laughs> Cowboy, who are you? Um, Bill McKenzie. I'm Ivy West's uncle. Oh, yeah. From Omaha, right? Utah. 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 I flew over Utah once. There was nothing there. Excuse me. Hello? What? No. I said absolutely not. Look, you just tell your boss at the network that I ain't presenting no Emmy to nobody unless I'm grabbing one of those suckers for myself. You got it? Thanks. You're so lucky you're from Utah, cowboy. You don't have to put up with all this crap. Oh, I'd rather fight a circle saw. They're eating me alive. I gotta get out. Why don't you? <laughs> yeah, I suppose I could go back to that... that crummy truck stop pouring coffee with all those big apes pinching my butt. You out of your mind? Not when I came in here. I can't get out. See, I'm a comic. It's the only thing I know how to do. Do you know that I played every crummy joint on the stand-up circuit in order to get where I am now? But see, this was supposed to be the big jackpot. All this was supposed to make me happy. Got what you prayed for. Yeah, but it, it wouldn't be so bad, really, if, if I just didn't have to look out for my butt every minute. Something, cowboy. People will get you if you let them. My daddy taught me that with the back of his hand. You might have heard me talk about that on Oprah. Missed that. Oh. Well, you know, they have reruns, so maybe if you could catch that one, then you'd know what I'm about. I think, um, 
the only person eating you alive is you. Uncle Bill. My Uncle Bill McKenzie, Toby Joplin. Toby's co-star and producer of the show. He's the boss. Well, I am when Josie lets me be. <laughs> Mr. Joplin. Oh, just call me Mr. Josie, Bill. Everybody else does. My uncle's worried I might be in trouble with you. Oh, Bill, my intentions are entirely honorable. Actually, I'd marry the girl if my wife didn't take such a dim view of that whole harem thing. Women can be so jealous. Mostly when they have good reason, is my experience. Uh, our mistress calls. Seriously, Bill, Ivy's the best production assistant I've ever had, and that's as far as it goes. You have my word. So the stories are all lies. Never believe what you read in the tabloids. That's my motto. Toby, we got problems. Will you stop all that yapping and get your ugly butt back here? I gotta go. Excuse Enjoy the show, me. okay? Excuse me, Toby. What is this, huh? You're supposed to be making Josie happy. She's meaner than ever. Who's a man with Mr. Joplin? Ben Landry, Josie's manager. She keeps him dancing. He likes doing that? Sure. She's a star. Well... Bill, are you satisfied that I'm not in trouble? I'm satisfied you're doing what you want to. And I'm happy. Tell Mom I'm happy. That's important. Hey, would you like to watch the show from the wings? Sure, that'd be fun. <laughs> okay, let me hear it. Who loves Josie America? Josie, 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 Josie. Okay, how many of you have ever been to a studio taping before? Okay, so you know the whole deal. Try not to nod off on me, okay? For the rest of you, a sitcom taping is a lot like watching a TV show at home, but there's a couple differences. On the plus side, there's no commercials. Yeah! And on the minus side, it takes about twice as long, and there's no zapping channels to catch the latest celebrity trial updates on Court TV. Uh, hey, oh, one more minute left to showtime. Would you like to meet the stars of our show? Yeah! Yeah! Ladies and gentlemen, the lovely young lady playing our teenage daughter, Regina Hooverman, Claire Howard! And as Regina's truck driver dad, the bumbling Bert Hooverman, our co-star, co-creator, co-producer, co-spouse of the year, not to mention Davenport, Iowa's favorite son, Toby Joplin! And finally, the lady who knew me when, the woman who put the blue back in the blue collar, the one and only star of our show, because without her, there would be no show. Ladies and gentlemen, Josie Joplin! We just love you so much, and I'm telling you, this show is going to be better than you even know. Lots of surprises, lots of good things. I want you to clap real loud, have a good time. Let's have a good show! Bert, tell Gina she's not going to date Ricky Denninger. You're not going to date Rick Denninger? Why isn't she going to date Rick Denninger? Because I dated his dad. And he thought no meant, come on, come on, try a little harder. <laughs> well, just because that happened to me doesn't mean it's going to happen to you. Oh, cut. You're an idiot. The line is, just because it happened to you doesn't mean it's going to happen to me. It's all that peroxide, you know, that blonde stuff that's eating up your brain. You're really obnoxious, you know that? What did you say to me? Come on, Josie, don't get upset. Huh? What do you mean, don't get upset? Wait a minute. Are you siding with her against me? Are you sleeping with her, too? Hey, Bimbo, I thought I fired you. Josie, there are people watching. Hey, get Please. Out of my way. We want to talk to you. You're such a loser. Do you know that? You're sleeping with all these women and siding with them against me. Josie. Your wife. Don't you know that I know, honey? How could. Do you think that I'm stupid? I want you to know something. I am not stupid. No, you're not stupid. You're just crazy. Crap! <laughs> Josie! You're just 
all go to hell, okay? Especially you. Yeah? Over your dead body. <laughs> Promise you some surprises. <laughs> it's gonna get even better tomorrow. Can I hear it? <laughs> About what happened in there. Morning. I... That was quite a performance. How did you know? Well, I saw Josie Joplin give the high sign of that girl's photographer. Publicity. It was Josie's idea. What about you, Ivy? Why do you go along with this? Every time Josie does something outrageous, the ratings go up. Mm. That's good for me, too. Mm. I didn't expect her to slap me. That was just rotten. Here's a little lower than that, darling. She doesn't seem to care what folks think about you. You mean Mom? Tell her it's just showbiz. Tell her that I'm... Ivy! Oh. I gotta go. Oh, it's so good to see you, Uncle Bill. Ah. Tell Mom I'll call. You do that. Our mistress calls. Awful sight. They were screaming, furniture crashing. I called you right away. Mrs. Joplin, are you all right? Mrs. Joplin, open it. Police, freeze. situation comedy Josie. Holy mother of pearl. 
Did when I got there. I didn't kill her, Uncle Bill. I never one moment thought you did. How's Mom holding up? She's worried. <laughs> I've embarrassed her and you. Now stop it, Ivy. Beating up on yourself won't help. Now, come on. Tell me what happened last night. Um, I was working in the production office. <laughs> and I got a page from Josie. Calling from where? The hotel. She moved into the hotel because um, she wanted the press to think that she'd walked off the show and disappeared. You know, more publicity. Mm -hmm. So her hotel phone number was on the pager? No. It was one of those pagers where you uh, phone into a central service. And, and then they send you a typed message on the pager screen. Yeah, well, how do you know it was, uh, the call was from Josie? The message said, get your butt over here. Oh. Yeah. Vintage Josie. Mm -hmm. So I got my butt over there. Did you tell anyone you were going over to Josie's hotel? No. Outside of the, um, <clears throat> the cleaning crew, I was the only one in the office. Why'd you sneak into the hotel by the back stairs? Because Josie wanted... Well, she didn't want anyone from the show seen at the hotel. Oh. I see. So you kept out of sight. See ya. The door to her room was open. It was dark inside. And somebody knocked me down. You get a look at him? Nope. It was too dark. Everything just happened so fast. <laughs> Did anything else happen last night at the studio or, or your home? Anything unusual? No. Or the jerk in the Jeep. What Jeep? This guy almost ran me down in the studio parking lot. Had you seen him before? Never. And I know everyone that works at the studio. Now, this guy was in a really big hurry. Mm -hmm. I remember his, his license plate because it had an odd number. It looked like it was a vanity plate, but it wasn't. You know, it was some um, 777 something. Yeah, 777. All right, now, just one last question, and this is important. Besides you, who else knew that Josie was moved over to that hotel last night? Toby, Claire, Ben Landry, Lisa. That's all. Mm. One of them could have framed you for murder. Your client and the deceased were in a public fight just one week before the murder. An audience of over 200 people heard your client Threatened Josie Chaffin. Oh, that was a publicity stunt, Lieutenant. It might have started out as a publicity stunt, and then it got serious. Josie Joplin threatened to fire your client. Your client knew she was going to do it and came here planning a murder. Uh, my client came here because Josie Joplin paged her. Wrong. We checked the hotel's computerized billing systems. No calls came into this room last night. No calls went out of this room last night. Know what I think, Counselor? What do you think, Lieutenant? I think your client called that paging service herself, and that obviously would give her an alibi. Well, you're entitled to your opinion, but I I'm partial to the facts myself. All right. Let's check the facts. Fact. The desk clerk phoned 911 to report hearing a violent struggle in Josie Joplin's hotel suite. Fact. That call was clocked in at 11.40 p.m. Fact. A patrol car arrived on the scene at 11.51. They entered the room at 11.54. Fact. You know what they found, Counselor? Not till you tell me. The deceased. Your client crouched over the deceased with the murder weapon in her hand. Fact. What about the 14 minutes between the time the desk clerk called 911 and the police arrived? What do you think my client was doing all that time? Waiting around to be caught or catching butterflies? Ask her. Doesn't it strike you maybe my client was set up? 
That's an interesting theory, Counselor, but personally, I prefer the facts. And the facts tell me we have this one nailed. Murder one, open and shut. Mm -hmm. The partial license plate Ivy gave you? DMV lists over 200 plates, starting with the number 777, but only one is a Jeep in the Los Angeles area. Did you get a name and address? Yeah, Martin Kester. DMV has him in an apartment out on Morrison Avenue in the Valley. Thought I'd drive out and meet him. Watch yourself. You might ask him what he was doing at the studio that night and why he was in such a hurry he darn near ran over Ivy. Uh, well, let's uh, see where we stand. Ken? Okay, according to Ivy, only four other people knew where Josie was that night. That would be Toby Joplin, Ben Landry, Claire Howard, and Lisa Kay. That's all. Her husband, her business manager, her co-star, and her best friend, they all knew where she was. Which means that any one of them had the means and the opportunity to plan and execute her murder. But did any of them have a motive? We need to know more about these folks, Janice. That isn't going to be hard, Mr. McKenzie. The people around Josie had their lives all over the tabloids. I know more about them than I do my own family. You read the tabloids? Ah, uh, no. No, I don't read them. I, they, they're there at the checkout counter, and uh, you can't help but glance at the headlines. How else would we know where Elvis is appearing? with my jeep relax relax are you martin kester who's asking my name's ken Milansky. i was wondering what you were doing outside the candle moss studios the other night oh uh, sure i Miss, my name's McKenzie, and I'm looking for Toby Joplin. Oh, sure, he's expecting you. Just a second. I'll walk you down. I gotta drop these on Lisa's desk. Oh, thank you. Uh, Lisa. Would that be uh, Lisa Kay, the comedian? Mm-hmm. She does the audience warm-up for the show. Oh, 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 all right. Yes. I'm okay? fine. Huh? I'm yes. Oh, I don't know what really? happens to me. Ooh. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Gee. No. The floor is slippery. They waxed it last night. I guess they did. You don't want to lose these now, huh? Thank you. Um, Toby should be back any minute. You can wait in his office. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Are you sure you're all right? Yes, I'm okay. fine. Thank Bye. you. Claire? Oh, I haven't had the pleasure. Uh, I'm Bill McKenzie, Miss Howard. Hi. I saw you on the news leaving the hotel where Josie died. You're Ivy's attorney. That I am. Well, you photograph great. Too bad Ivy's guilty. 
Thanks again, and I will have Bob call you. Terrific. Gee, uh, I've been thinking a lot about Ivy Bill. Arrested for murder? That must be awful. Girl's tougher than she looks. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Now's a good time. Let's go for a walk. The network wants us to stay in production. We'll change the name. Call it Josie's Family. Introduce a new character, Josie's mean old Aunt Maggie. This must be a very difficult time for you. Oh, huh? it's been brutal. Hey, Sally, looking good. I understand you and your wife had a colorful relationship. Oh, I had the bruises to prove it. Yeah, she claimed you came after her with a baseball bat. Now, is that really true? That's a lie. It was a tire iron, and she hit me. The woman had a temper like a volcano. Why'd you stay with her? Josie almost killed me, but she never bored me. I loved her. Is it true that she made you sign a prenuptial agreement? So if you divorced her, you'd uh, be left without a cent? Now, who told you that? Who sold me out? Well, you talked about it on uh, Oprah. Who knew anyone was listening? <laughs> Luckily for me, Josie and I were happily married. According to an interview in the National Informer the day she died, said she was uh, divorcing you. Oh, that's a lie. They made it up. Josie were here, she'd tell them. Just what is the truth here, Mr. Joplin? Uh, just one more uh, question, Mr. Joplin. Where were you? your wife was being murdered, sir. I was right here in my office. Anybody see you? No. But what about Ivy? I mean, she and Josie hated each other. But the story's right here. Read it. All right, you read this. Oh, what's this, another interview? I'm gonna have to see you in court. Hi, Patricia McDonald, Ken Malansky. Mind if I come on in? Excuse me, am I supposed to know you? You ought to. You took my picture outside Martin Kester's apartment building just before you almost ran me down. You're a photographer. How did you find me? Well, I got your license plate number as you drove away. You're good. The DMV says your name's Patricia McDonald. You work for the National Informer. Are you checking me out because you like me? Or is snooping your hobby? You tell me. You're the reporter. What were you doing outside Martin Kester's apartment building? I don't have to tell you anything. <laughs> you know, cameras have always fascinated me. Now, let's see. Where do we put the film in? Ah. Oh. Here, I see. Let's look at it this way. You owe me what's on this film. Okay, look. I'm covering the Josie Joplin case. I followed you from Perry Mason's office. You're working for Bill McKenzie. You were my best lead. What can you tell me about Kester? You mean the guy in the Jeep? Nothing. What's his story anyway? How's he connected to the case? Who says he's connected? Right. Like you'd be doing all this if he wasn't. And what am I doing? Tracking me down, asking me if I know the guy. You don't know where he is, and you need to find him, right? <laughs> right. Maybe I can help. How? Do I get an inside crack at the story from you? You tell me where to find Kester, and we'll talk about it. Give me my film. Why? Well, that's how we find Kester. After you.
Hollywood agents? Don't get me started. You know why a lot of medical labs across the country are using agents instead of rats in their experiments? They found the students don't get as attached to agents. Who's there? Bill McKenzie. Go ahead, I'm enjoying your monologue. <sighs> Speaking of animals, I just found out what you get when you cross a lawyer and a snake. You get an agent who can shed his skin. <laughs> I hear you chuckling. Are you sure you're an attorney? Oh, yeah. 40 years now. Just getting the hang of it. Where'd you learn about lighting? Well, I used to work backstage when my wife was an amateur actress. She was good, too. A lot of folks said she ought to make a career of it. But she, uh... Said she didn't want to leave the ranch. Didn't want to leave me. <laughs> Said she was content. I hope so. God knows I was contented with her. You enjoy working on your material. The truth, doing stand-up terrifies me. Is that why you haven't played clubs since you and Josie Joplin split up? Josie and I were a team. When she went off to do her sitcom, I couldn't get any solo bookings. Well... Gosh, I find that hard to believe. I read a lot of reviews of your act together. A lot of critics thought you were funnier than she was. <clears throat> Am I supposed to be flattered? So, instead of striking off on your own, you uh, took a job warming up Josie's audience. Why would you do that? Well, maybe I was afraid of performing without Josie. Maybe she was afraid of you. The competition wanted you in her shadow. No, she couldn't force me to do that. A couple of years ago, you two had a real knockdown fight. Josie withdrew uh, felony assault charges, but only after you signed a long-term contract with her production company, right? So you're saying she blackmailed me? I'm saying she cut you a deal. No, you're wrong. Josie dropped the charges because we're old friends. Well, your old friend wouldn't release you from your contract a couple of weeks ago when you were offered a Showtime comedy special. Or six months ago when uh, another network wanted you for your own sitcom. Or a year ago when you were offered a job in a movie. She had you boxed in, Miss Kay. Didn't she? <laughs> Josie and I would have worked it out. <laughs> Not according to your agent. He said she was killing off your career. Now I know why I hate agents. Can you tell me where you were the night Josie died? Yeah, I was in the production office working on material for my warm-up routine. Did anyone see you? No, but I've got it on tape. Wanna hear it? <laughs> sure. Gentiles and ladies, men. Oh, <laughs> Sorry I'm late, but I ran into my agent on the way over here. Unfortunately, he survived. <laughs> anyway, I got hassled by a panhandler on the way in. Well, why don't you hang on to that? Maybe we'll play it in court. <laughs> Not my best side. I didn't know lawyers had a best side, Milanski. Go ahead, sweet talk me. I can take it. Oh. oh, careful. Try not to bump into anything. Some of that stuff for slide processing can be flammable. Thought it was getting kind of hot in here. You seem to know what you're doing, so why are you wasting all that talent on the National Informer? The Informer is a good paper. <laughs> oh, yeah. Space aliens advising Bill and Hillary. Four-year-old girls giving birth. That's real Pulitzer stuff. Well, we all got to do what we got to do till we get what we want. And this is just the beginning. One of yours? No. Well, all the excitement was happening. I was taking pictures at a rock club. It's the next page. Check it out. Just my dumb luck. When the story hit, I was halfway across town. Which is why I need a hot lead from you, Melansky. Bingo. So Kester's in Masseur at the Beverly Hills Health Spa. I'll check it out. Great. I'll come with you. I said I might give you a story. 
Hey, fair is fair. I never said that you could tag along in my investigation. Really? That's great. Wait a minute. I have something that might change your mind. There's another picture you ought to see. Come here. I didn't just fall for that, did I? I did. Patricia! I noticed Kester go into the building. And by the time I got here, he'd already started the fire. Oh, yeah. I know, partner. <coughs> oh, we're talking total multimedia, gentlemen. You get the entertainment software you need for your electronics hardware. We get a new outlet for our product. Everybody's happy. We must be clear. You personally control all rights to this material. 16 hours, gentlemen. 16 hours of Josie Joplin concert tapes previously unseen and unedited. Perfect for video and CD and yours for a seven-figure song. What do you think? Gentlemen, um, would you excuse me for just a minute? Uh, Irene, get the boys whatever they want. Well... Mr. McKenzie, this is a surprise. Well, I see you're busy. Uh, I just yes. need a few moments of your oh. time. I could wait. Uh, well, yes, I am in a meeting. Could you make it fast? Oh, I'll make it uh, yes. right to it. Uh, now, you were Josie Joplin's business manager. Yes, I was. Yes, poor Josie. Well, she was my favorite client. Oh, she was your only client. Uh, uh, well, she... <laughs> when you're handling as someone as big as Josie Joplin who needs other clients, right? No, I mean, uh, once she became a star, she made you drop all your other clients. No, that's no, that no, that's just wrong. Now you're making things up here, Mr. Oh, McKenzie. No. no, I don't make things up, Mr. Landry. Sure, Josie needed full-time handling, yes. But you see, she made so much money for the company. I was happy to do it. We owned her production company together. Did you know that? No, get out of here. Josie Joplin was ending your partnership. You're lying, Mr. Landry. No, I, uh, two days before her murder, she filed papers cutting you out of her production company. She was firing you. Ah, uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, I'll be right with you. Irene, get them whatever they want. You know, 
What does that lawsuit have to do with anything? Well, it shows he's dead, then so is her lawsuit, huh? I mean, that leaves you in control of her company. Now, that is a, that's a pretty good reason for wanting your client dead. Obviously, you don't understand the business, Mr. McKenzie. Could be. Enlighten me. To put it in terms that you would understand, Josie was the cow. And without the cow, there's no milk, now is there? So even if I keep my share of the company, how do I profit now that she's dead? Well, counting domestic syndication and cable rights to her show, uh, foreign sales to multiple markets, not to mention exploitation of ancillary rights and interactive and multimedia, I'd say that you're looking at a potential annual revenue stream in the $100 million range for the rest of this decade. Your cow is going to be given milk for some time, Mr. Landry, dead or not. I didn't kill her. Uh, and you won't mind telling me where you were while Josie was being murdered. I was at the studio. I was in her office on a conference call with investors. I was on from uh, 11.30 to almost 11.45. You can check with my people back there, and they will tell you. I'll do that. Have a nice day, gentlemen. I'll see you in court. <laughs> There he is. That is Kessler. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Kester got away. Yeah, so did she. I hate dead ends. Come on. Howard, just uh, more. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Excuse me. Please. Ms. Howard would like to tell all her fans that she's heartened by their love and support in this time of tragedy. Will Claire stay or leave the show? Well, she'll stay through the end of this season. As for next season, it'll depend entirely on her feature film career. Has Claire had any offers? Several. All for starring roles in a number of upcoming films. Uh, are those the same film roles that Josie Joplin wouldn't let you take a couple of weeks back, Miss Howard? Uh, I'm sorry. Who are you? Uh, Bill McKenzie. I've been trying to reach Miss Howard. She keeps ducking my calls. Is it true that Josie Joplin tried to sidetrack your movie career? I'm sorry. Uh, Miss Howard has to get back to the set. Uh, I'd be glad to answer. Any other questions you might have? What does Claire know about Josie's murder? Oh, that's something for the district attorney's office to handle. Who's the guy with Claire? Are they going to get married? <laughs> You'll have to ask her. You're a hard lady to talk to. Why is that? You stay away from her. Do you want her to answer my questions here or in court in front of the TV cameras? What is it that you want to know? I just need to clear up a few things. Now, you had an exclusive contract with Josie Joplin's production company, am I right? Everyone knows that. And she had the right to veto any movie roles you might be offered. If she felt it would harm the show's family reputation, yeah. It's a standard clause in a lot of show contracts. Yeah, I know, but didn't she use that clause to keep you from taking any movie jobs yeah. at all? It didn't bother me, Mr. McKenzie. I mean, after all, even the most successful TV show ends. I knew I'd have other opportunities. I'm young. Well, not as young as you want folks to think. What is that supposed to mean? 
Well, forgive me, Miss Howard, but uh, your publicity says you're 22. That's about 10 years off the truth, isn't it? Tabloid gossip, Mr. McKenzie. Not if Josie told him you were born 32 years ago in Wahoo, Nebraska. We've located your birth certificate, Miss Howard, the real one. You're 32? For God's sake, Steve, shut up. So I play younger than my age, so what? But how long could you go on doing that? She was robbing you of a movie career, wasn't she? What does she have against you? Not a thing. Josie didn't need a reason to be mean. Boy, how you must have hated her for that and wanted her out of the way. Right. Look at me. I couldn't beat Josie in a cat fight. Never mind, kill her. I'm not strong enough. Oh, maybe not, but he is. Hey, a couple of minutes ago, you were mighty eager to defend your lady. Back off! who's quick to anger usually feels he's got something to prove Just get out of my what? way Steve. Uh, what do you got to prove huh? you don't have a name do you i'm warning you Steve. maybe you don't need a name maybe it's enough to be claire howard's boyfriend steve boy he's got a temper smart girl like you might find that temper useful where were you when josie was being killed mr boyfriend he was with me in my dressing room at the studio the guard saw us ask him i'll do that and i'll see you both in court early tomorrow morning As night clerk at the Belmont Hotel on the evening of Josie Joplin's death, did something unusual occur which caused you to summon police to the hotel? Yes, sir. Please tell the court what happened the night of the murder at approximately 11.40 p.m. Well, I heard sounds of a struggle, a violent struggle in Miss Joplin's room. I immediately called 911. The police arrived 10, yeah, about 10 minutes later. We all went upstairs. We knocked on Miss Joplin's door, but there was no answer. Did you enter Miss Joplin's room with the police at that time? Yes, sir, I did. And what did you see? I saw her. Indicating the defendant, Ivy West, Your Honor. Her clothes were all messed up. Her sleeves were torn. She was bending over Miss Joplin's body. Thank you, Miss Michener. Your witness, Counselor. Ms. Mitchner, um, now you call the police at 11.40 and uh, you entered the uh, Mrs. Joplin's hotel suite at 11.54, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Now, during those 14 minutes, did you see anyone enter or leave Miss Joplin's hotel suite? Oh, no, there was no one. Where were you? Me? Yeah. I was outside, waiting for the police. So, anyone could have entered or left the hotel suite during those 14 minutes you were outside waiting for the police, and uh, you wouldn't have seen them, would you? No, sir. <laughs> That's what I thought. I have no further questions. The people call Lieutenant Ed Brock. I am showing you People's Exhibit 7, which has already been identified as the murder weapon. Can you tell us if any fingerprints were discovered on this lamp by the forensic team? We found several prints on the lamp, all belonging to the defendant, Ivy West. Were any other fingerprints found on the murder weapon, Lieutenant? Only Miss West. The people have no further questions, Your Honor. Uh, uh Lieutenant, oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, now, you say the only fingerprints found on this lamp were those belonging to my client? That's what I just testified. Now, how, how do you explain that? I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, uh, in a busy hotel room, people are coming and going all the time, turning the lamps off, feeling them and all. How, how, do you, how do you explain the fact there's only one set of fingerprints on this particular lamp? Well, maybe the hotel maid wiped the lamp when she came in to clean the room. Did you that ask her if she did? No, counselor, I didn't ask her yeah, if she did. But didn't. now, what, what if I tell you? that the hotel maid did not clean the room that day because Mrs. Joplin wouldn't let her in, then that means someone else must have wiped this lamp clean. Uh, probably the real murderer. Objection, Your Honor. Argumentative. Assumes facts not in evidence. Calls for speculation. Withdraw the question and thank this officer for testifying here today. Nothing further. Uh, you, may, uh, you may step down, Lieutenant. Thank you. We're doing fine. Where's Ken? I called in earlier. He's tracking down a lead. I hope he got a good one. Call its next witness. Five, six, and seven, and eight. All right. 
Will you please tell me what we're doing here? Listen, Milansky, if you want to find Kester, just do as I say. Now, I snatched the appointment sheet off the receptionist's desk. The woman's name is Rosa Westlake. Like I thought, she comes in every day. My source tells me she has a jealous husband. She's in there. She's waiting. Waiting for who? You. Oh, this is as far as I go. Good luck. Make it real deep. I'm very tense. Westlake requested another masseur today. Take over an 18. Oh, yeah. You must be new here. You have marvelous hands. We're an attorney. Oh, you're an attorney? What, is business that bad? Oh, actually, business is booming. Uh, we have to work on this muscle. You're holding a lot of tension oh, here. Oh. oh, yeah. Your life in the big city. Oh. Actually, I, I'm working on the Josie Joplin murder case. And I think that you could be a very important witness. We're looking into a Martin Kester. I believe you know him. I don't remember Martin Kester. Well, let me give you a hint. He gave you a gold necklace. Oh, God. Just don't tell Sydney. It's your choice. Tell me about it here, where I can hear your side of the story. Or if you'd rather, Bill McKenzie can take you apart in court. In court? Or here. Request permission to examine Mr. Joplin as an adverse witness, Your Honor. Uh, within reason, Mr. Wells. Mr. Joplin, on more than one occasion, your wife accused you and the defendant of having a love affair, didn't she? <laughs> Actually, uh, yes, uh, once she did, yes. And there was truth to that accusation, wasn't there? Well, could you define truth? Your Just Honor. answer the question, Mr. Job. The question, uh, were we having an affair? Uh, you mean me and Ivy, Ivy West? Okay. All right. We'd been seeing each other. The truth is that you and Ivy West have been intimate for months. Well, by intimate, do you mean uh, a drink after work or an early bird dinner or... Uh... Mr. Joplin, you are under oath. Okay. Okay. We were intimate. So, your... Your wife's jealous rage wasn't a publicity stunt. <laughs> she was madder than hell. And your wife had a reputation for, um... Shall we say, getting back at people who made her madder than hell, didn't she? Oh, sure. Well, everybody knew that Josie liked squashing people. Not that she wasn't sweet. She loved animals. Why, well, you show Josie a stray dog or a cat and she just... Thank you, Mr. Joplin. No further questions. Mr. McKenzie? Uh, no questions at this time, Your Honor, but defense reserves the right to recall this witness at a later time. Noted the witness may step down. The people rest, Your Honor. Oh, he's lying. You know he's lying. Uh, he's good at it, too. Tosses him off like he believes in himself. We'll get him. Mr. McKenzie, is the uh, defense ready to call its first witness? We are, Your Honor. Uh, defense calls Lisa Kay. Mr. McKenzie, this is Ken. Good. I'll be right back. Janice? Janice? I'm losing you. It's the connection. I'm going to call you back. Here, yeah, try mine. It gets great reception. Thanks. Is this any better? Tell Bill that we're up the road from 1300 Malibu Ridge. It's a mountain house. Yeah, Kester's there. We'll just keep an eye on him until we hear back from Bill. Thanks, Janice. What's our friend up to now? 
I don't know. He was in there a few minutes ago, but I, I can't see him now. Try looking over here. Come on. Gentiles and ladies, men. Uh, sorry I'm late, but I ran into my agent on the way over here. Unfortunately, he survived. <laughs> anyway, I got hassled by a panhandler on the way in. Now, you say, uh, that while Josie Joplin was being murdered at the Belmont Hotel, you were in the production office at the studio making this recording of your warm-up routine. That's right. Now, uh, on the part of the tape we just heard, the sound is very clear. Is the whole tape that clear? Yes, it is. Well, that's, that's odd. You see, the morning after the murder, I was at the studio being escorted down the hall by a secretary who slipped right outside the production office door. I had to catch her because the floor had just been waxed the night before. Your Honor, what's the point of this? Your Honor, there's a 14-minute gap between the time the police were called about this murder and the time my client was discovered in Mrs. Joplin's hotel suite. Now, I believe the real murderer used those 14 minutes to frame my client, and I want to establish that there were several other people who had both the motive and the opportunity to do so. I'll uh, permit this line of testimony within reason. Now, you can go ahead, Mr. Well, Ryan. thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, uh, Mr. Ryan of the studio cleanup crew is in this court. Mr. Ryan is prepared to testify that on the night of the murder, his cleanup crew waxed the hallway outside the production office door from 11 p.m. until just past midnight with an industrial waxing machine. They make an awful racket. You could never have recorded anything on this tape without picking up that sound. So, if you weren't at the studio making this recording while Josie Joplin was being killed. What were you doing, Miss Kay? Now, we've established that Josie Joplin's lawsuit would have cost you everything you had, Mr. Landry, and yet you say that while she was being murdered, you were on a conference call to investors? From 11.30 to 11.45 p.m., that's right. Now, you made that call from Josie's office at the studio. Yes, I did. From a studio phone. N no, n not exactly. Oh! You made that call from a cellular phone, didn't you? And uh, the call lasted from 11.25 to 11.31, not 11.45. So you could have made that call from anywhere, even from your car on the way to Ms. Joplin's hotel, so you don't really have an alibi for the time of the murder, do you, Mr. Landry? Steve and I were in my dressing room. A studio guard saw us. Yes, that studio guard is right here in the courtroom, Mr. Serbic. Yes, Mr. Serbic uh, will indeed testify he saw you in a passionate embrace. I told you. But not with your boyfriend, Mr. Gelson. You may sit down, Mr. Serbic. How is that possible? Well, because he saw your boyfriend driving away from the studio a half hour earlier. Now, you may have an alibi for the time of the murder, but Steve Gelson doesn't, which makes me wonder. Why would you perjure yourself for no reason? Do you have a reason? What are you trying to hide? Or whom are you trying to hide? I got people coming after me. I do not like that. What? No, shut up. Shut up. Shut up. You're already in this too deep, pal. Now, you listen to me. Unless you want to see your name in the paper, you better get over here with some cash, and you better do it right now. You got that? You know, Marty, can I call you Marty? The informer has a very generous tips to reimbursement policy. She's going to say anything to get a story. Her paper's never going to pay. Shut up. Why did you say that? He's an exclusive. Because if you pay him, it ruins his credibility as a possible defense witness. Oh, right. You think you're going to see him in court? 
He's holding us prisoner. Think positively, Patricia. Besides, I said potential witness. Now, why don't you help me with these ropes? Uh, how do I do that? Let's see if I can work this rope through that Indian bracelet of yours. See if I can sneak up on him. You stay here. Oh, and lose my story? You're nuts. Pardon me, son. I'm a little lost. How far to Malibu Canyon? Bill, that's Kester. He's got a gun. That's all right. So do I. Drop it. All right. What are you doing outside the studio the night Josie Jotham was killed? Did someone hire you to kill her? Hey, look. I didn't kill anybody. All right. All you got to do is ask him. He'll tell you who. Ask who? Ask who? Oh. I like your timing, Mackenzie. The girl with the camera still following this story. Yeah, it just keeps getting bigger and better. That's one way to look at it. He might have proved I'd be innocent. Killed Martin Kester, could have killed Josie Joplin. Boy, oh boy. I give my prize Appaloosa for a new lead. Well, I've always wanted a horse. Try that. You keep it storage. Storage locker key. Where'd you get this? From Martin Kester's gym bag. He left it in his car. You took evidence from the crime scene? Well, no. The car was on the street. It was unlocked. Perfectly legal. Pretty clever, huh? It should have been turned over to the police. I thought you'd be pleased. Well, I'll be pleased when Lieutenant Brock gets this key. Then we'll ask him to find out what's in the storage locker. Well, you do it any way you like. But I am not losing the story. You never quit. Neither do you. Oh, they just made for each other. So were Bonnie and Clyde. Think so? If a girl cuts too many corners, I'm gonna get her into trouble someday. I just hope Ken's not there when it happens. Get you the Lieutenant, in your investigation into the homicide of Martin Kester, have you been able to find anything out about his lifestyle? Well, we learned that Martin Kester lived way beyond his means. He had an apartment filled with expensive clothes. He also had a vacation house under a false name. And yet his only apparent source of income was his job as a masseur at the Beverly Hills Health Spa. As far as we've been able to determine, Counselor, that is correct. Our Lieutenant, I'm opening People's Exhibit D, a shoebox, which the police removed this morning from Martin Kester's storage locker. Has your lab been able to identify the white powdery substance? The lab identified that as cocaine, Counselor. Thank you, Lieutenant. No further questions from this witness? Your Honor. This witness uh, may be excused. Your Honor, the people fail to see the relevance of this line of testimony. Storage lockers and shoe boxes. Where's this all going? Yeah, the court is equally as curious. Uh, Mr. McKenzie, uh, where are you taking us? I need to ask the court's indulgence, Your Honor. Uh, you have my word. This is all going somewhere. Well, then I suggest you get us to there, and quickly. Defense calls Mrs. Rosa Westlake to the stand. Now, Mrs. Westlake, you understand that you are in a court of law and under oath. Yes. Now, will you tell us, please, what is Martin Kester to you? My monsieur. And what else? My lover. Who gave you the gold necklace you're now wearing? Yes. He stole it, didn't he? No. But someone else did. Thank you. No more questions, Your Honor. Mr. Joplin, you said you had an affair with Ivy West. 
That was untrue, wasn't it? Oh, right. Like I'd sit here in court telling the world I was cheating on my wife if I wasn't. Now, why would I pull a bozo stunt like that? To cover up something you wanted to hide. How much money do you have in your personal bank account? Well, who knows? Ask my accountant. The other day while I was waiting for you in your office, your bank statement was laying on the table there. My assistant subpoenaed a copy this morning. I was struck by the size of your balance. $300. I don't need much money. You mean you don't have much money, don't you? When you married Josie Joplin, she made you sign a prenuptial agreement so that all your acting and producing fees went directly into a joint account. And then she put you on a strict allowance. Your own personal bank account never rose much above $1,000, did it? I had all I wanted. I don't think you did. You recognize this necklace? Never saw it before. Oh, look again, Mr. Joplin. Your wife was wearing this necklace in the wedding photo you keep on your desk. That same picture was reprinted on the front page of this newspaper. I thought it looked familiar. Yeah. <laughs> Very unique necklace. Gold choker with a raised diamond design. It was given to Rosa Westlake by Martin Kester. Kester got it from you, didn't he? Well, now, I might give him flowers and candy, but why would I give him my wife's necklace? To pay for an ounce of cocaine. Kester was a drug dealer, and you were his biggest customer, weren't you? Hey, expect a call from my lawyer. That's defamation. Not if it's true. Kester kept a ledger of all his transactions. On the night your wife was murdered, a customer called T.J. traded a gold necklace for an ounce of cocaine. T.J.? Toby Joplin? Were you up at Kester's house yesterday when he was murdered? No. I mean, I didn't kill him. Right now, the police are up there at Kester's house looking for your tire tracks. A lot of TJs in this ledger. 811, a diamond pin. 921, a sapphire bracelet. Emerald earrings, on and on. Did your wife find out you were stealing from her to buy drugs? Did you kill her? When she threatened to divorce you? <sighs> the tabloids made that up. She loved me. No, I think she loved her television show even more. It was a family show, a sitcom about an American family. Now, Josie knew the show wouldn't be on the air very long if the public found out that its co-star and producer was buying drugs like some back-alley junkie. She had to choose between the show and you, and you lost out, T.J. Well, you tell a good story, Mr. McKenzie, but... Where's the punchline? If Kester was blackmailing me, threatening to tell Josie, then why would I murder Kester after Josie was already dead? Why, for the same reason your wife was divorcing you, to protect the show. You're now the sole star, the sole executive producer. Kester could have taken all that away from you, and he threatened to do just that, didn't he? Come on, Mr. Joplin. Your tire tracks are up there at Kester's house. It's time to fish or cut bait. All right. Kester would have ruined me. But I didn't kill Josie. The truth just doesn't want to come out of your mouth, does it? Why don't The night you... Josie was murdered, I was with Claire. Claire and I were having an affair. More like a fling. A small fling. But I love Josie. I never would have hurt her. Your Honor. Nothing further. 
I suggest under the circumstances that the people hold off the cross-examination allow Mr. Joplin to confer with his attorney. This uh, court is recessed until tomorrow. Wow. Sorry, Mr. McKenzie. So am I. Toby didn't kill Josie, and Claire didn't. That leaves Ben Landry and Lisa Kay. One of them must be the murderer. Yeah, but which one? And how we prove it? It's the hound we're after. I had Chinese food for breakfast. Cold pizza, though. Now that is different. How about popcorn on the side of cold beans? Oh, God, no. So you got the photos? Great. I'll have the story ready for you by deadline. Thanks, Jack. I've got the front page locked for tomorrow's edition. Well, if you work for a real paper, you'd have a Pulitzer. You don't get it, do you, Molansky? The National Informer is just my first step. On to bigger and better things, huh? You bet. And you will have to stop by sometime. Help me polish my Pulitzer. Thanks. To the both of you. Oh. See you in court. Sorry. You like Patricia McDonald, don't you, Kenna? Well, uh, she's smart, but she's tough. She gets what she wants. She goes after someone and she gets them, whatever it takes. Who does that? Boy, I can't get it. I just can't take it in. Why would Josie Joplin give Patricia McDonald a story that was untrue and would make her look foolish? You know, for publicity. Say whatever you want about me, just spell my name right. No, but some stars do resent those kinds of stories. Josie Joplin was threatening a lawsuit. Yeah. Toby said the divorce story was a lie. There's something wrong here. Bucket of snakes. What? Ken? Ken, you got some calls to make. Uh, Miss Kay, uh, you told this court that while Josie Joplin was being murdered, you were taping your comedy act. You lied about that, didn't you? Yes, I lied. Will you tell us what you were really doing that night? I was making a telephone call. To Jack at 315-555-7232, am I correct? How did you know that? We subpoenaed your phone log. You made a lot of calls to Jack, didn't you? Jack's an old friend. 315-555-7232 is the phone number of the National Informer. Jack Handley is the editor. You were his source for the stories about Josie Joplin, weren't you? Yes, most of them. Exclusive interview, Josie confirms divorce, blames girl Friday. Did you give Jack the tip for this story? No. That story was a stunt. And when I read it, I called Jack and I warned him that he'd been ripped off. This story in the National Informer was a fraud? Yes. See, Josie was a shark. And once she sunk her teeth into you, she'd never let go. She'd been trying for years to catch the informer. And that story was a lie, and the writer didn't cross-check it. And Josie was going to nail him. You hated her, didn't you? Yes. And I still hate her, but I didn't kill her. Thank you, Miss Kay. I have no further questions. Your Honor... The people reserve their right to cross-examine this witness later. You may step down. Mr. McKenzie? Defense calls Patricia McDonald to the stand. Miss McDonald, how long have you worked for the National Informer? Uh, six years. You're well paid? Very well paid. So you like working for the National Informer? Big bucks and front page bylines. What's not to like? 
Then why have you applied for a job at almost every major news organization in the country over the last six years? The Denver Post, Cleveland Plain Dealer, San Francisco Chronicle, Washington Post, New York Times, L.A. Times, on and on. These are copies of your job applications, aren't they? Something wrong with that? Well, they turned you down, all of them. Working for the informer has wrecked your credibility as a legitimate journalist, hasn't it? it? It's difficult for any reporter to get on those papers. Miss McDonald, what would happen to a writer who caused the national informer to lose a libel suit costing millions of dollars? The um, writer would be fired. Your byline is on this story. Josie Joplin gave you an exclusive interview in which she told you that she planned to divorce her husband. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. Did you cross-check this story? Oh, well, I got it straight from Josie, in her own words. In her own words? Isn't it true that so long as the tabloids don't use direct quotes, they can print all kinds of lies, filth, and trash, and say it comes from, quote, reliable sources, unquote? Well, some tabloids may do that. But a direct quote in her own words. That opens the door to a libel suit, doesn't it? It can. Knowing that, and knowing Josie Joplin's reputation for having a mean streak, why would you trust her own words? Well, I had no reason not to. Because this wasn't the first story she'd given you, was it? No, it wasn't. She slipped you other stories from time to time. Nothing as spectacular as this. And you printed them, didn't you? Yes, I did. And they were all accurate? Yes. She fed you accurate stories so you wouldn't be suspicious when she fed you a lie. She set you up, Miss McDonald. She put your paper on the spot for a 20 or $30 million libel suit for a story she would deny ever giving to you. And that would have meant the end of your high-priced job in your career as even a tabloid reporter. And if you couldn't get a job on the informer at the bottom of the barrel, you'd be finished. You had a motive for murder, didn't you? I was halfway across town when Josie was killed. I was taking pictures at the Roxy. This picture? Yeah, uh, see that clock? It says 11.40, and Josie was killed at 11.40. Now, how could I be at two different places at the same time? Maybe you can explain something to me. Oh, what's that? The woman in this picture is a movie star, very famous, very married. Well, that's the point, Mr. McKenzie. She's married, and she's dancing with some guy that isn't her husband. That's what makes it a story. I understand that. But why is this married woman wearing her wedding band on her right hand? Now, let me show you the negative. We'll call this Defense Exhibit G for identification. Uh, we acquired this negative under subpoena from the National Informers Archives. Now, while you're trying to decide whether you want to recognize this negative, let me show you two enlargements of it. We'll call them Defense Exhibit H and I for identification. The married woman is wearing her wedding band on the wrong hand in this enlargement of the newspaper photograph because you flipped the image when you developed it. You reversed it to give yourself an alibi. In this enlargement of the original photograph, the clock does not say 1140. It says 1220. You were at this nightclub after midnight, not before, which means you had more than enough time to kill Josie Joplin and get across town. You can't even prove I was at her hotel. Your cellular phone bill shows that you called Ivy West Pager Service 
at 11.38 and left the message, get your butt over here, Ivy thought that call came from Josie Joplin, but it really came from you. You had only one reason to make that call, Miss McDonald, to frame my client for the murder that you committed. Time for the truth, Patricia. The truth. Reporters are supposed to like the truth. It's all I ever wanted to be, a good reporter. I told myself I'd take a job at the Informer for a few years just for the money, and then I'd get a job back in mainstream press. But you can't go back. You can never go back. The Informer was all I had. She was going to take it from me. I begged her not to do it, but she said the trial would be good publicity. She was going to destroy me for publicity. I had to kill her. I had to. She was asking for it, wasn't she? I have no more questions, Your Honor. Under the circumstances, Your Honor, the people move for a dismissal of all charges against Ivy West. Case dismissed. Court is adjourned. Bailiff. Will you please take this witness into custody? Oh, Mr. McKenzie, congratulations. Thank you. Uncle Bill, you were great. You're very important to me, Ivy. I was thinking about college. Yeah. Would I be crazy to change my mind and go back? No. You're supposed to change your mind. You're young. Young people get off track sometimes. Sometimes they find their way back. Sometimes they don't. Right this way, miss. It's the biggest story in town, and she won't be the one writing it. Yeah. Let's get out of here. Don't even think about it, son. Rolling out of the woodwork wherever you go. You sure took care of him? Just toast this morning. Yes, ma'am. Wheat toast. I was watching the weather report this morning. It's gonna be a beautiful day, Miss Draper. Beautiful day. Yes, it certainly is. Just be a minute. Of course, these days, no line would be complete without something for the working woman. Therefore, I created these. Very nice. I think we can do some business. Thank you. My things should do very well in your stores. Looks like what I've heard is true. What have you heard? 
But you're back from the dead. I prefer to think of it as having been on a creative sabbatical. Excuse me, Mr. Sabatini, somebody's here to see you. Take a closer look, I'll be right back. Hello, Marco. A buyer? With any luck. What can I do for you? Let's talk. In private. Also, a microphone was pointed at you, Marco. Recorded every word you said. You want to hear the tape? No. Good. Because every time I hear it, I get very angry. What are you going to do? I am going to bury you two. You're going to print this? Next issue of Sweet 2000. Editor's column. You can't do that. Why not? Give me one good reason why I shouldn't tell everybody what a sorry piece of scum you are. I'll pay you. Anything you want. I have connections you can't believe. Keep those. I have copies. Oh, by the way, Marco, your new line looks fabulous. Too bad no one's going to want to touch it after I get through with you. I have bad news. Desk. Everyone's in the conference room. Here's your coffee. Good. And Tanya Sloan is inside waiting for you. She's what? I'm sorry, Miss Draper. I couldn't stop her. Lacey. She just came bodging in, saying that she absolutely had to talk to you and that she'd do something horrible if any of us tried to make her leave. Oh. So, Tanya, what is this horrible thing you're threatening to do? A scene from that play you bombed in last year? That's not funny. Interesting, that's exactly what the critics said. In fact, dear, shouldn't you be at an acting class or something? For your information, I fly to Los Angeles tomorrow to meet with Kevin. He wants me to co-star in his next picture. So, go home and pack. Not until I know if it's true. If what is true? I heard you're going to write about me in your next column. Should I, Tanya? Have you been a naughty girl? I have worked too hard to get where I am. I am not going to let you ruin me. Tanya, two sayings come to mind. You made your bed, now lie in it. And, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. And I do mean, get out. And here's one for you, Diane. What goes around, comes around. Bimbo. shot these? Kim Weatherly. Oh, they're very good. Must be all that practice he got in Newark. Okay, go with these three. Okay? All right. Let's look at the layout. Come on, come on. All right. This is cluttered, juvenile, unacceptable. Do it over. Diane, we go to press tomorrow. Not with that layout, we don't. Look, if I'm gone by the time you finish, bring that over to my apartment tonight. And if it's still not right, your next assignment will be to clean out your desk. Got it? All right, Julia, what's next? Uh, pages 95 through 97 are okay, ads. Excuse and... me. Mr. Aper, it's 1210 and you're at a 1230 luncheon. <sighs> All right. Everybody back here at 2. Thank you, Gerard. Would you like a cocktail while you wait? Just the usual. Mineral water with a splash of lime juice. Very good. Seltzer with lime, table four. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Your name? Mason. Perry Mason. Ah, it'll just be a moment, Mr. Mason. 
Damn luck, they're busy. That's good. Means they haven't changed chefs since the last time we were here. Uh. Lauren? Della Street, what a surprise. I've been trying to reach you. Perry, you remember Lauren Jeffries? Well, of course, nice to see you again. <laughs> what are you doing in New York? Perry's receiving an award from the American Bar Association. Congratulations. Della deserves it just as much as I do. I can believe oh. that. You know, I still think the woman behind the man story that we did on you was the best in the whole series. Oh. In fact, it's probably the best we've ever done, period. Come on. Listen, how is Metropolitan doing? Oh, it's doing great. The it, magazine practically runs itself these days. Then you could join us for lunch. Well, yes. actually, I have plans. I just dropped in here and have work so But I really do want to see you. How long are you going to be in town? Just till Friday. Well, call my office this afternoon. We'll figure out something. Okay. Oh. Wonderful. I'd love it. Mr. Mason, this way, please. I'll be right with you, sir. It's only common courtesy to return a phone call. We have a deadline. I was too busy. May I sit down? I am waiting for someone. Then I'll keep you company. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you. Very interesting. Diane Draper chatting with Lauren. Should I know who Diane Draper is? Only if you read the fashion magazines. She runs a magazine, Sweet 2000. It's Metropolitan's biggest competition. Very tough lady. Uh, is she and Lauren competitors? More like uh, bitter rivals. Now, why in the hell would I want to waste my column on you? Because the way things are going, my magazine is going to overtake yours within a year, and you are desperate. Huh, you wish. Yeah, well, I know how you operate, Diane. I, I know how it turns you on to hurt people. All I do is sell magazines. Oh, yes, by digging through people's garbage and then tearing them to pieces in that column of yours every month. Look. All I do is tell it like it is. Not about me, you don't. What the hell is that? A threat? A warning. Have a nice day. Newark. Julie, what, what do you mean she said something about Newark? She said something about you getting a lot of practice there. Did she say what she meant by that? No, it was an off in her mark. She didn't mean anything by it. Is she in? No. Even if she was, she wouldn't want to talk to her. We publish tomorrow. Kim, these are great. I'll tell you what, as soon as Diane gets off the warpath, I'll pass them along, all right? You seen a column? For next month? No, she never writes until the very last minute. Who's she going after this time? Why do you ask? I got a feeling it's going to be me. Oh, man, not you, too. I mean, every month it's the same thing. People who are just positive that Diana's gonna write something bad about them come crawling out of the woodwork begging her not to. I mean, half the time she's never even heard of them. Yeah, that's over. Come on, come Let's go! Diane. Wait, wait, Kim, Kim, Kim. Uh, don't, all right? I'll talk to her. And if you come by my place for dinner tonight, I'll tell you what she said. Okay. Okay, it's 926 West 74th, apartment 219, let's say 7.30. Here are your messages. Who'd you like to call back first? Nobody. I'm going home, and so are you. All right. See you in the morning. Good night, Lacey. Good night. Diane, can I talk to you? Tomorrow. I'm out of here. You written your column yet? That's why they invented home computers, Julia. Well, it's just that people have been bugging me all day about who you're going after this month. What are you telling them? That I don't know. <laughs> Good. And people will be surprised. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Yeah, what? Uh, there's somebody here to see you. Uh, it says her name is Lauren Jeffries. Send her up. You can go up. A pop in 4B. Thank you. Snow White herself. What a surprise. We gotta have this out, Diane, once and for all. Yeah, I love it. Paris, my favorite city on earth. The city of light. Mm? No, mm. maybe I think it's the city of food, you know. <laughs> no, no, darling, it's it. No, it's no, 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 no. Hello? Yes, this is she. No, 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 that's no problem. Um, I'll be right there. I'm, I'm not too far. All right. All right, bye-bye. Julia, you're leaving. Yeah, look, I'm sorry, but uh, somebody was supposed to drop a layout off of Diane's tonight, but she's not answering the phone or the door. The security guard's worried something may have happened to her. Um, I'm really sorry. Just, um... I won't be long. So why don't you just wait here, all right? Diane? Diane, it's Julie. Are you there? Trying to keep. It's really odd. She's just trying to make me laugh. What happened to her? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Hurry. She's dead. We don't want any. Lauren Jeffries called while we were at the banquet. She's been arrested. Karna puts the time of death between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. Not only did the security guard log Miss Jeffries into the building at 7.54, but the person living in the apartment next to the victim heard shouting and loud noises at around 8.20. That was five minutes before the security guard locked Miss Jeffries out of the building. But no one actually saw anything. We also found some of the victim's jewelry in the bottom drawer of Miss Jeffries' desk. Detective Brennan... Doesn't it seem a little strange to you that a woman who makes half a million dollars a year would stoop to robbery? Guess she was just in the mood. A floppy disk was stolen out of the victim's computer that night, too. Did you find that in Miss Jeffrey's desk? No. But the victim's secretary found what we're assuming was on that disk in the computer at the magazine the next morning. Apparently, Miss Draper had transmitted it via modem sometime before she was murdered. It was her column for the next editor's page, all about how Miss Jeffries had solicited bribes from fashion designers. She would give them favorable press, and they would give her money. Lauren Jeffries stole that disc and killed Diane Draper in an attempt to save her reputation. It's as simple as that. But this isn't true. None of this is true. But Diane was going to print it. I have never taken a bribe in my life. No one has ever paid for editorial space in my magazine. Why did you go to see her that night? For the same reason that I went to see her that day in the restaurant. I was number one on her hit list. She was determined to get me. I wanted to stop it. Because she was becoming a nuisance? She was calling people, trying to get dirt about me. That wasn't all. I knew that if Diane put her mind to it, she would eventually find some, some way to, to discredit me. I don't believe that. Well, we all have our secrets. Some we should know about? Yes. 
I have a daughter. I was 16. Back in Odessa, Texas in those days, when a girl got pregnant, she stayed pregnant. I, I wanted to give my baby up for adoption. But my boyfriend, Scott, wouldn't hear of it. So, two weeks after she was born, I, I left her at Scott's. I got on a bus to New York, and I never went back. You left your baby? I had to. I assumed that Scott's grandparents would take care of her. I found out later that they made him do it all by himself. Instead of going to college, he got a job at a rendering plant. He worked there until he was 38, at which time he died of what amounted to alcoholism. There's no reason for all of this to come out in court. There's more. My daughter managed to get out of Odessa. She came to New York and got a job at Sweet 2000 as Diane Draper's assistant. Her name is Julia Collier. Does she know you're her mother? Of course. She wanted to work for Diane to spite me. Did Diane know? Oh, yes. She loved to rub my nose in the fact that my only daughter hated me every chance she got. But it isn't the kind of thing that she would have put in a column, if that's what you're getting at. Why not? Well, because it was common knowledge. I mean, people in our business already knew. If she put it in her column, it would have been a, an embarrassment, but that's about all. When you went to her apartment that night, did she tell you her column was going to be about you? I couldn't get her to talk about anything, so I left. You weren't the one who took that disc from her computer? And I wasn't the one who killed her. I swear. Well? Well, what? You still haven't told me if you've decided to take her case. Stella, there are thousands of very good attorneys in this city who would jump at the chance to defend a woman who is not only innocent, but who can pay their fee without blinking an eye. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you have something that they don't. What is that? Secretary, who will find it very hard to forgive you if you turn this case down. Della. Perry, she needs you. Della. Oh, Perry. Uh, call Ken. I already have. What's that? Here you are. Tanya Sloan, mm -hmm. the actress? Rumor has it she's going to co-star in a very big motion picture. Ah. And that she had an argument with Diane Draper the day of the murder. And they were going to talk about the column that Diane was writing, because she only went after the rich and famous, right? Miss Sloan certainly fits that profile. Here you are, Kim Weatherly. And Marco Sabatini. Weatherly's the hottest fashion photographer in New York right now, and Sabatini's a very successful clothes designer. Kim was overheard expressing concern that Diane's next column was going to be about him. And Sabatini? Diane's driver said she dropped in to see him at his showroom on her way to work the morning of the murder. But if her column was going to be about one of these three and not Lauren Jeffries? How do you explain the column that was on the computer at the magazine? I'd say the killer dictated a phony column to her and forced her to send it before he killed her. Maybe he wrote the column himself and sent it after he killed her. Check with the phone company. It wouldn't hurt to know the precise time that document was transmitted. But why your client? Why'd the killer frame her? Lauren had a confrontation with Diane in a restaurant. Later that day, that confrontation was common knowledge among the people in the fashion industry, plus the fact that she and Diane were long-standing business rivals. It all made her the perfect patsy. Well, I guess I'll start with Tanya Sloan. No. Start with Sabatini.
Tanya's in L.A., but she'll be back Friday. Yeah, I'm looking for Mr. Sabatini. Oh, he's not here. He's not? No, I took the day off. Well, how come I just saw him walk in here? You didn't. My name's Ken Molansky. I'm an attorney. I work with Perry Mason. You might have heard of him. He's representing the woman who's accused of killing Diane Draper. I'd like to talk to Mr. Sabatini. Well, when I see him, I'll tell him. Well, you must have a good memory. Like an elephant. Did Diane always write her column at home? Not always, no. But she did it often enough that sending it to the computer at the office was no problem. Well, yeah, she worked at home and modem stuff in all the time. In other words, anybody could have used this computer to modem something to the office. What are you getting at? I think Lauren Jeffries was framed. By whom? Tanya Sloan, Marco Sabatini, or Kim Weatherly? Do you know any of them? Well, yes, I know all of them. They all apparently thought Diane was going to write about them in her next column. Look, Mr. Mason, Kim was with me when this happened. From 7.30 right up until the time I came over and found the body, we were having dinner at my place. And Diane kept her jewelry here? As far as I know, yeah. Well, thank you, Julia. I've seen enough for now. I've been meaning to ask you something. Let me guess, does it have something to do with the fact that Lauren Jeffries is my mother? You didn't need me to let you in here. You could have gotten a key from the police. She thinks you hate her. I do. Why? Why? Have you ever heard her side of what happened all those years ago, Julia? No, I really don't want to hear it. You should hear it. Mr. Mason, she murdered Diane. It wouldn't hurt to hear her side of that story either. After you. Sabatini. You are Marco Sabatini, right? Sabatini took a day off. I just want to ask you a few questions. You have the wrong person. You're going to have to talk to me sooner or later. Maybe never, counselor. Sayonara. Yo, taxi. Hey. Mr. Mason. Mr. Mason, hi. I'm Peter Whalen, assistant district attorney. I'll be prosecuting the Jeffries case. And you must be Della Street. Hi, I'm Peter Whalen. Nice to meet you. Thank you. I can't tell you what an honor this is, sir. Mr. Mason, I think you're the greatest. I've studied every single one of your cases. Every case? You're one of my idols. I begged for this assignment. I'm, um, I'm flattered. I've never looked forward to anything so much in my life. Well... I'm looking forward to trying this case, too. No, no, Mr. Mason. I'm talking about beating you. <laughs> Your Honor, the 
defendant owns homes in London, Saint-Tropez, New York, and Vail. Now, she has bank accounts not only in those four cities, but in Bermuda and Switzerland as well. In other words, she could very easily flee this jurisdiction and take residence in any number of countries with no significant decline in her lifestyle whatsoever. In fact, Your Honor, the risk of flight is so great here that the state requests that bail be denied. Mr. Mason. Uh, Mr. Wyndham, if what mattered most to my client was being affluent and enjoying a certain lifestyle, Your Honor, she would have retired to any one of those geographical locations years ago. What matters most to her is her magazine. She created it, nurtured it, watched it grow and mature. It's what has kept her here all these years. And it's what will continue to keep her here long after these charges have proven false. I request that she be released on her own recognizance. The charge is murder, Mr. Mason. An OR release is out of the question. However, the court is not entirely unmoved by your eloquence. Bail is set at $250,000. Let's see, gentlemen, how does the 27th sound? Uh, that's fine, Your Honor. Prosecution concurs. Good. The court will adjourn for lunch. We will resume at 2 p.m. Thank God. I can't wait to get out of here. Lauren? I think that maybe it's time we talked. Oh. All right. Um, dinner tonight? All right, um, I'll call me when you get home. Can you believe that? Wonderful. Let's get out of here before she changes her mind. I'll see you at the hotel. I know you'd go with the, uh, her magazine as her life argument. But, frankly, I couldn't think of a way to deprive you of it. Well, I'm sure you'll do better next time, Mr. Whalen. You bet I will. Oh, I almost forgot. I have something for you. Preliminary list of the people I'm going to call as witnesses. You can't be serious. I'll see you here in court, Counselor. What now? I may have to remove myself from this case. Why? The argument we overheard in that restaurant. Wayland plans to call me as a witness. Lauren, you don't understand. I want you to be my lawyer, and that's that. There's a very good chance I'll be called to testify against you. I don't care. I'd be in the position of helping the prosecution convict you. How can you help convict me when I'm innocent? Lauren, it's not as simple as that. Look, if you're telling me they won't allow you to be my attorney, that's one thing. But if you were asking me if I still want you to be my lawyer, I think I've made myself more than clear. Mandela.
Okay, cut it, cut it. Terrific. You guys all right? Good, good. Tanya, you got about 20 minutes, okay? Good. All right, Gary, get Billy Ray down here. I want to hear, not on the phone. Miss Sloan? Very amazing. Ah, you made it. It's a lot of work for a commercial. Well, commercials these days are sometimes bigger than films. This one's for a new perfume called Purloin. I gather you have a few questions you'd like to ask me. Shall we talk in here? I understand you talked to Diane Draper the day she was murdered. Yes, I did. And that your conversation didn't last very long. No, didn't. May I ask what you talked about? I uh, heard that she was going to write about me in her column. Your drug problem? I do not have a drug problem. Diane thought you did. Yeah, well, she was wrong. Besides, she couldn't prove anything. Still, if there were speculation about it... It could have ruined me. Look, I don't know why Diane had it in for me. Maybe she was jealous. <laughs> Who knows? Was she going to write about you in her column? Mr. Mason, at the time of the murder, I was at a play called Harley's House. It stank. But I told the writer I loved it because I was his guest and he still pulls some weight in Hollywood. Okay? Okay. Before today, I'd have thought it impossible for you to be in two places at once. But I can't say that anymore, can I? Hey, Marco's in? No, I haven't heard from him yet. Then who's that for? Somebody who's waiting for him, an old friend from out of town. A friend? Mm-hmm. Give me that. Okay, pal, take a hike. Until I talk to Sabatini. What for? You already been through his desk, haven't you? Now, what makes you think I'd do a thing like that? Get lost before I have you hold him for trespass. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. I'm the ammo. Right. Exactly. On Wednesday? Sounds wonderful. I think we can do that. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, he said I'd probably have better luck finding Marco at that place he usually hangs out at. Damn, I forgot the name already. Gabriella's? Gabriella's, yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. I suggested we go to dinner from here so I could see where you live. It's very nice. Mm, thank you. Of course, I've known for a long time where you live. I just never. Look, uh, maybe this is a bad idea. I don't know. You've got to let me explain. <laughs> you don't want to explain. No. You want to make excuses. I want to tell you what happened. No, I know what happened. You decided that you didn't want me. That's what happened. You didn't want me, so you just left me. I was 16 years old. I didn't know what I wanted. Well, all I know, lady, is that you didn't want me. You were better off without me. How, how dare you even say that to me? I mean, even kids whose mothers swore at them or hit them. I mean, I envied them. I mean, at least their mother hadn't taken one look at them and then just walked away. <clears throat> Your father was ready for you, Julie. I just wasn't. I went away from you because I didn't know how else I was going to survive. I thought being with a father who was devoted to you would be enough. I didn't know how horribly it was going to hurt you. I 
wouldn't have stayed. I couldn't. I'm sorry. So, uh, what do you propose we do now? I mean, are we supposed to start over? Is that it? Said you found Sabatini. Yeah, but look who he's with. How you doing, right? Everybody all right, Dad? I know. Mr. Mob himself. What should we do now? What you came to do? I mean, I started the day chasing a dressmaker. Wait, Perry, wait. Excuse me, Marco Sabatini. Who are you? My name's Mason. I represent the woman accused of murdering Diane Draper. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Albert Nardone. And I have heard of you. And I have you. I've heard you know more about criminal law than I do. <laughs> what kind of questions do you want to ask my cousin, Mr. Mason? Your cousin? But he's the son of my cousin, but it's family. That's the important thing. I don't care what kind of questions he has. If he wants to talk to me, he does it in front of my lawyer. And since my lawyer's not here, neither am I. Uh, I'm afraid he's stubborn like his mother. Mr. Mason, join me. Uh, rain check. Sure. You getting to be a bad habit, you know that? License number. Well, I didn't get the color of the car. Sabatini's bodyguard saw him. Who knows? He and Nardon split the minute the cops showed up. Think that's why Sabatini was afraid to talk to us. It's not guns involved. Possible. Well, that's it. That's it. about several thousand cars. Yeah, but the car we're looking for has a broken headlight. Whoever was driving it may have stolen. That's true. Not much of a lead, is it? You better tell the police and head back to the hotel. I want you to get a good night's sleep. Oh, uh, Ken. It's a lead. Hey, Lieutenant. Give you a lift? Oh, thanks, I can take a cab. <laughs> Come on, why pay for a cab when you can ride in this nice limo for free? Because I don't want to take a ride in a nice limo for free. I got something right here, says you do.
So I wanted to talk to her. So what? You also tried to call her that day four times. I repeat, so what? So what was that important? I just turned in some proof sheets. I want to know what she thought. It had nothing to do with those pictures you used to take in Newark? You lost me. Before you became a fashion photographer, you paid the bills by taking pictures for a businessman in Newark. A man who has since been jailed for the sale and distribution of pornography. Who told you that? It came from notes found in Diane Draper's office. If she'd put that in her column, it would have been disastrous for you, wouldn't it? People in this town tend to be very open-minded. Not your present publishers. Look, I don't even know why we're having this conversation. I was with somebody the night Diane was killed. I have an alibi. I was with a friend. Maybe you well, also have friends who would agree to do okay. you a favor. Here you go. I got him on the line. Hello, Mr. Mason. No. You're going to have to excuse me. Uh, when I went to pay for breakfast this morning, I discovered I was missing a credit card. Yeah, I'd like to report a missing card. This uh, business, a pleasure. Well, actually, it's a little bit of both. The magazine's doing the shoot, so I came over to supervise, and I really like to watch Kim work. Your dinner with your mother went well, I hear. Yes. Anyway. But we still have a long way to go. But you're talking. Yeah. Would you excuse me for a minute, please? right, Ken Melansky. Well, you, me, Tony over here, Mason, we all want the same thing. We do? Yeah, we do. Marco was my relative. Not a close relative, but a relative nonetheless. You want to know who killed him? I want to know who killed him. Well, if you want to know the truth, we sort of thought that you might have had him killed. <laughs> that goes to show you how much you know. Tell me something, Mr. Melansky. Uh, what do you think? The teal or the periwinkle? Excuse me? Which material? For the dress? Never mind, never mind. The teal. Teal. Two years ago, Marco came to me on his knees. He just learned uh, the hard way that he lacked the one thing it takes to be a good clothes designer. Talent. So I told him I'd give him enough money to get on his feet on one condition. That he let me design the dresses. He could have all the credit. He agreed, and the rest is history. You design dresses? I love doing this. I'm very good at it. But in my profession, one has to maintain a certain image, so I keep it a secret. Oh, yeah. But whoever killed Marco killed my partner, as well as my cousin, and I want to find out who that was. Marco killed Diane Draper? No, no, no. He said he didn't, and I have to assume he knew better than to lie to me. And what were you two talking about last night? Well, she knew something about him, something bad. And uh, he was worried that someone like Mason would say it gave him a motive for killing her, so he was asking my advice. What was it she knew about him? He didn't tell me, and I didn't ask. But I want to know who killed Marco, Mr. Malansky. And since I am a little disappointed in Tony over here for letting this all happen right under his nose, 
that Tony's going to make up for it by helping you find the killer. Isn't that right, Tony? Yes, sir. Oh, now, now, wait a second. Take them both back to the hotel. Hey, hey, I don't work for you. You can't do this. Hey, hey, look. All right, all right, I'll watch. What is this? It's a subpoena. It ensures your presence at this hearing. I may need you to testify. Testify? What's to testify? I told you I had nothing to do with Diane's murder, and I have no idea who did. The writer you went to the play with said you went outside to have a cigarette during the first intermission and didn't return until the third act. Oh, so I had several cigarettes. Like I told you, the play stank. Make yourself comfortable, Miss Sloan. Lieutenant! Where did you find this jar? It was lying a few feet from the victim's body. Because of the presence of blood and tissue, it was believed to be the murder weapon. In fact, Your Honor, this jar has been stipulated by counsel to be the murder weapon. And did you then have the jar examined for fingerprints? Yes, sir. And for purposes of probable cause only, what was discovered? A fingerprint matching the defendant's right thumb was identified. Now, what did you do next? Search warrants for the defendant's office, home, and car were executed. And what was found? A gold necklace and bracelet belonging to the decedent were discovered in a desk drawer in the defendant's office. Thank you, Lieutenant. Mr. Whalen, may I? Thank you. Now, Lieutenant Brennan, did you find the defendant's fingerprints anywhere else on this candy jar? We found prints from her left hand up near the top. If a woman were to pick up a heavy jar like this to look at it, would you expect her to use one hand or two? Two. Like this. Right hand on the base, left hand near the top. Possibly. Did you find the defendant's fingerprints anywhere else in Miss Draper's apartment? They were all over the place. Door jam, desk, chair. And were they all over the victim's jewelry as well? We didn't find any prints on the jewelry. Not even the victim's? The stuff had been wiped clean. Don't you think it's strange, Lieutenant, that the defendant would wipe all her fingerprints from that jewelry? Jewelry she then put into her own desk, and after doing that, not bother to remove a single print of hers from the scene of the murder? Objection. Relevancy. Mr. Mason is commencing his argument. Sustained. Withdrawn. Nothing further. You want to look through our files? Uh, we believe one of your cars was recently involved in a hit-and-run accident during which one of its headlights was broken. What we'd really like to do is take a look at your damage reports. Sorry. You can't see a thing without a court order. Yeah, well, court orders take a lot of time, and we don't have a lot of time. Corporate policy is very strict on such matters, okay? You want to go through our files, you got to have a court order or an okay from the senior vice president. So call the senior vice president. Oh, in your dreams. Look, if you don't help us Ken, out, Ken, the wrong Ken, please. Could I have a sec? Let me introduce myself. My name is Tony Loomis. I am a dear, dear friend of Mr. Nardone. Are you aware who Mr. Nardone is? Oh, wow. Thank you. Uh, I'll just go talk to the senior vice president on your behalf right now. Yeah, uh, please, have a seat. Yeah, can I get you anything? You want Diet Cola? Nah, we're fine. Yeah, no, I'm fine. What did you say to him? I just made sure he understood how important it was for us to find that car. Chris Collier. <clears throat> How long have you been a decedent's executive assistant? About uh, three and a half years. And your job entailed what? I made sure that whatever she wanted done got done. Would you say that it entailed working closely with her? 
Yes, very closely. Uh, ten hours a day, sometimes six days a week. So you knew her well? Yes, very well. And as someone who knew her very well, how would you characterize the relationship between her and the defendant, Lauren Jeffers? Were they friends? No. Enemies? Competitors. Simply stated, there was bad blood between them, was there not? Yes. Didn't they have a violent argument which you witnessed last year? Yes. And isn't it true that to your knowledge, they didn't talk to each other for over a year until the defendant barged into a New York restaurant last week and verbally attacked Ms. Draper? That's true, <clears throat> yes. What is your relationship to the defendant, Miss Collier? Uh, she, she, she's my mother. And even you, Lauren Jeffrey's own daughter, can't deny the fact that the defendant was violently angry with Diane Draper, can you? No, Thank I... Thank you, nothing further. Thank you. Don't cross-examine her. Lauren, I can't let this stand. Perry, please. Mr. Mason. A moment to confer with my client, Your Honor. Perry, let it stand, please. I don't want her embarrassed. It's difficult already as it is. Cross, Mr. Mason. No questions, Your Honor. Witness may step down. Your Honor, for this next witness, the state calls Perry Mason. I understand that you witnessed a confrontation between the decedent and Ms. Jeffries at the La Mistral restaurant last month. I saw them discussing something. I'm not sure confrontation is the right word. The discussion was loud, wasn't it? I couldn't make out what they were saying, so... No, I wouldn't say it was particularly loud. Would you say they were more agitated? Animated is the word I'd use. Mr. Mason, could you see their expressions? Yes. Well, would you say the women looked calm or angry? I'd say they looked earnest. You didn't answer my question. Your question was badly phrased. You're being deliberately evasive, aren't you? I'm answering your questions as best I can. You're playing semantic games with me, Mr. I'm Mason. I'm doing no such thing. And in thing. doing so, you're depriving this court of the truth. I am Gentlemen. being a responsible How can you witness? behave like Gentlemen. this, counselor? A man of your reputation. Gentlemen. Uh, my reputation has nothing to do with it. Gentlemen, please, stop this at once. We just had an argument, didn't we? Yes. One that was every bit as acrimonious as the one Miss Jeffries and the decedent had in that restaurant. Isn't that correct, Mr. Mason? What we had, Mr. Whalen, was just a difference of opinion between two professionals. Intense, perhaps, but I still like you, Mr. Whalen. Just because two people have an argument doesn't mean they harbor ill feelings toward each other. Doesn't mean they're going to go to war. I have no further questions. You may step down, Mr. Mason. That's it, they're jerking us around. This guy's history and so is his boss. Oh, sit down, don't you ever get tired of talking like a two-bit hood? Hey, the way I talk gets results, and that's what life's about, college boy getting results, so just shut your face and let me handle this. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, gentlemen, this is Deborah Richards, Senior Vice President of Triborough Auto Rental. Hi. Uh, Gerald here told me you want to go through our damage reports. I'm afraid that's out of the question. Wait, listen, ma'am. I'm sorry. Corporate policy forbids it. I'd like to help you, but I just can't. No, no, no. Obviously, you Tony, don't... Tony, Miss Richards, could we talk privately for a moment? Uh, you have to excuse my friend. Sometimes he gets a little temperamental. You know, I was thinking...
<laughs> All right. The garage is 10 blocks up 1420. I'll have someone meet you there. Thanks. We really appreciate it. You coming? What'd you say to her? Oh, I just told her how important it was that we find that car. Results, Tony. That's what life's about. Okay, if it'll make you stop pouting, I asked if we'd go down to the lot and take a look at the cars that were returned to them damaged. Here you go. That's all you said? That's all I said. You don't always have to be a bully to get results, Tony. Get out of my face. I think somebody gave you a call about us? Yeah, you're the guys who want to see the cars. We've got scheduled for shop work. That's us. Well, here they are. Wow. All these cars, huh? Yep. These and seven more floors. She said something like, I'm going to have it out with you for once and for all, Diane. Then they went inside. And after you got back from walking your dog, what happened? Well, I was in the living room reading when I heard Diane yelling at someone next door. I couldn't make out exactly what she was saying, but she sounded furious. <laughs> then I heard a thump. Thump. And then a bump. A bump. And after that... Nothing. Hmm. Any idea what time that was? 8.20. I remember looking at the clock. 8.20. 8.20. According to the security guard's testimony, that was a good five minutes before the defendant was seen leaving the building. Thank you. You're welcome. Is uh, that all? That's all. Ms. Wilson, are you married? My husband died six years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Any children? Just my daughter, Shannon. And she's how old? Fifteen. Was she home that night? No, she was out with friends. On a school night? I told her to be home by ten o'clock, and she was. I notice you're not wearing a watch. Ever wear one? No. I have very sensitive skin. Watch bands give me a rash. I'm sorry. Do you uh, watch a lot of TV? Oh, I hardly watch any. My daughter does, but I'd rather read. So when you're home by yourself, as you were that night, the only way for you to know what time it is is to look at a clock. Well, yes. Thank you. I have no more questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Witness may step down. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. The state rests its case, Your Honor. Very well. Is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, it is. Uh, defense calls Shannon Wilson to the stand. Miss Wilson, what time did you get home the night Diane Draper was murdered? Ten o'clock. Are you sure it was ten? Yeah, just ask my mom. The thing is, when I ask the security guard who keeps a record of everyone who enters and leaves the building, he said you got home at 10.30. He did? Wow, it, um, he must have made a mistake. Shannon, isn't it true that before you went out that night, you set all the clocks in your mother's apartment back so you could spend an extra half hour with your boyfriend? Isn't that true? And isn't it true that you reset all the clocks before your mother got up the next morning so she'd never know what you'd done? I wouldn't do something like that to my mother. Shannon, this lady could be your mother. And this lady is on trial for murder. Now, it's very, very important that you tell the truth. All right, I, I set the clocks back a half an hour. I'm sorry. So, when you got home that night, it was really 10.30, not 10 o'clock. 
which means when your mother heard those sounds coming from next door, it was really 8.50, not 8.20, which means the murder occurred some 25 minutes after the defendant was seen leaving the building. Thank you, Shannon. Nothing further. Mr. Whalen? No questions. Witness may step down. Here you go, my man. Thank you. He's on his way. He's on his way. You'll see. Hey, you want something? I'll have this. Yeah, make that clear. Grazie. There you go. Thanks a lot. I still can't believe we went through 793 cars and still couldn't find the one we were looking for. That's because the guy who whacked Marco just hasn't turned it in yet. That's all. Now you know. Educated guess. The guy figured people ask fewer questions if he turned it in after he got the headlights fixed. I mean, that's what I would do. Yeah, I guess that's what I'd do, too. Just wait right here. Hey, Marco, what's going on? Hey, Marco, what's going on? Just out of curiosity, how'd you end up working for a guy like Albert Nardone? I was born in the Bronx. Went to grammar school at St. John Vianney. Went to high school St. Helena's. Got to know some people who knew some people. How'd you wind up being a yuppie lawyer? Born in Providence, St. Wenceslas Grammar School, Casimir Pulaski High School. College and law school in Denver. Denver? Uh, did my graduate work in Brooklyn, the Knights of St. Paul. I learned to shoot pool. <laughs> I learned to shoot pool at the National Polish Alliance Center. Polish Center? You any good? No, I just play for fun. Ah, yuppie lawyer hustle. I love it. Got to play you sometime, see how good you are. Yeah, sure, sometime. Yo, Rocket, you got here quick, just like I asked. I like that. Hey. Tell them what we're looking for. You mean the car? Of course I mean the car. All right, uh, according to what the mechanic at Triborough said about this year's fleet, it's a 91 Ford Taurus, brown. Yeah. Broken right headlight, possible dent in the hood, possible dent in the right front fence. Yeah. Got that? Got it. So get going. Come on, get out of here. What the hell was that about? You'll see. Come on. Come on. Yeah, all right, all right. Come to order. All rise. Department 79 is now in session. The Honorable Renee Trayball presiding. Be seated. Mr. Mason, I believe that you were about to call your next witness. Uh, your Honor, may we approach? Your Honor, a witness has come forward whose testimony is extremely relevant to this case. The state moves to reopen his case in chief so that she may be called without delay. Now, in anticipation of defense counsel's objections, I can cite at least three cases where similar motions were granted. I have no objections, Mr. Whalen. You don't? No, I don't. Oh. In fact, you can put her on the stand right now. Really? Really. I just ask that when you're through, I be granted a recess so I can prepare a competent cross-examination. Mr. Whalen? Great. Very well. Granted. Mrs. Cooper. How are you? Good. How's the neighborhood? Nice. Good. I understand the window of your kitchen affords you an unobstructed view of the entrance to the garage of the decedent's apartment building. Is that correct? That's right, uh-huh. Please tell the court what you saw the night Diane Draper was murdered. Well, when I went in the kitchen around a quarter to nine to get a snack, I noticed someone standing outside on the sidewalk by the garage like they were waiting for someone. I didn't think anything of it, of course. But on my way out of the kitchen, I saw that a car had just come out of the garage, and as the door started coming down after it, this lady all of a sudden ducks underneath it and goes inside. You saw her enter the apartment building via the garage? That's right, uh-huh. What makes you so sure it was a quarter till nine? I was watching TV. My favorite sitcoms were on that night. I got up during the commercial, so it must have been about a quarter to. Is the person you saw that night here in this courtroom today? Uh-huh. That's her over there. Let the record show that the witness pointed without hesitation to the defendant, Lauren Jeffries. Ms. 
Cooper, I'm glad your health is good. I'm glad your neighborhood is nice. Now, why did it take you so long to come forward? Because I didn't realize what I saw that night was important until I saw her picture in the paper a couple of days ago. You're absolutely certain the defendant is the person you saw into the garage that night? Absolutely, uh huh. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to conduct the brief experiment we discussed in chambers. Again, I object. Again, you're overruled. In view of the situation, I believe that Mr. Mason is more than entitled to a little leeway. Bayless, proceed, Mr. Mason. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Cooper... Would you say the distance from where you are sitting to the back of the courtroom is greater or less than the distance from your kitchen window to the sidewalk outside the garage? Less than, definitely. And would you say there is more light <clears throat> at the back of the courtroom than there was on the sidewalk that night or less light? More. Once again, Ms. Cooper... Would you point to the person you saw duck into the garage of the decedent's apartment building the night of the murder? The second one from the right, that, sir. The second from the right. Let the record show that the witness did not point to the defendant, but I do think I know why you thought you were pointing to her, Mrs. Cooper. Now, Ms. Cooper, I handed you a newspaper when you took the stand. Will you please open it to the front page? Now, that's the newspaper article and picture you mentioned you saw a couple of days ago, was it not? Yes. The person you just pointed to is wearing the exact same thing Ms. Jeffries was wearing in that photo. That's why you assume she was Lauren Jeffries, is it not? From what you saw in that paper? Yes, I guess so. Thank you, Ms. Jeffries. Now, are you absolutely certain it was Lauren Jeffries you saw enter the garage that night? No, I guess not. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. No further questions. This place does the best work in the city. Got cars booked for repairs clear into next month. The one you're looking for? I think this is it. This has got to be it. Nice work. Here, give me that. Rocket, you're a genius, huh? Hey, Tony. Go buy yourself a slide rule or something. Come on. Get out of here. Call you. It's fantastic. It's great to have a friend in the auto industry. He's in the car business? My buddy can strip a car faster than you could write up some legal paper. Huh? Is the rental agreement in there? Yeah, here it is. your name on it? Yep. JFK, make it fast. Hi, Kim. My name's Ken Melansky. I work with Perry Mason. This is my friend Tony Loomis. Could we talk to you for a second? Hey. Forget about JFK. Hey, come on. I gotta get there. Where are you going so fast? I'm on assignment. Nothing more. We found the car you used to kill Marco Sabatini. What, what are you talking about? This is a copy of the rental agreement. Your credit card, your signature. Hey, I didn't sign this. I lost my credit card weeks ago. I don't know what you're yeah, talking you're about. My boss will want to talk to you anyway. So come hey, on. This is where you and I park company. What the hell are you doing? What's going on? Hey, Cam, you see what I got here? Come on, yes, Tony. Sir, you you can't, can't do this. Get out. Can't do get out. out. Come on, man. Get out of here. Hey, taxi! can I do for you? I'm here to see Mr. Nardone. And your name? It's not important. What's well, important to me? I'll tell you what's important. I'm here to consult with Mr. Nardone on some new fabrics. Evidently, he doesn't like his periwinkle. Well, I don't know. You don't know? Look, I'm on a tight schedule. 
You'll just have to tell Mr. Nardone. I'll see him sometime next week. Hey, hey, okay, okay, just wait a minute. The dart. Hey, hey, back here! He's coming with me. I'm sorry, Mr. Nardone. All right, all right, all right. Don't worry about it, all right, Mr. Malansky? As far as you're concerned, he took a cab to the airport. He was never seen again. He said he's coming with me. Come on, can you us? What's the difference? He's gonna get what he deserves. We don't know what he deserves, Tony. He killed my cousin. You don't know that for sure, just like we don't know for sure he killed Diane Draper, and nobody will know anything for sure if you kill him. Escort Mr. Molansky back to town. Will you please? Yeah. Go on, get him! Said I escort him, not rough him, huh? I'm not leaving here without him. You're pushing your luck, college boy. Let, let him go, let him go. Tony. You better know what you're doing. Because I can always settle the score with him. And you, later. Come on. Let him go. All right, Tony. Where were we? You had reason to believe the decedent knew about your involvement in pornography, did you not? Yes. You were worried she was going to expose you in her next column, is that not correct? Yes. Which is why you went to her apartment that night. I never went to her apartment that night. You tried to talk her out of writing about you, and when that failed, you killed her. I couldn't have killed her. I was with someone that night. Julia called you? Yes. Call her up here, ask her. You were at her place? Yes. When did you get there? 7.30. And when did you leave? When she did, around 10. You were in her apartment the whole time from 7.30 till 10? Yes. Did you have dinner while you were there? Yes. What did you eat, do you recall? We had Chinese. <laughs> Where did the Chinese food come from? You went out and picked it up, did you not? You were gone from Ms. Collier's apartment from 8.30 to 9.15, is that correct? It wasn't that long. The building where Diane Draper lived is only eight blocks from Julia Collier's and only three blocks from the Chinese takeout, is that not correct? Wait a minute. You had 45 minutes. It would have been no problem at all for you to walk from Julia's to Diane's to the takeout and back again. Is that not correct? I didn't do that, I swear. Of course you didn't. Mr. Whalen. No questions, Your Honor. Witnesses excused. Court will reconvene at 10 tomorrow morning. All rise. Congratulations. Looks like things are really looking out for him. Huh? They are now. Considering what just happened here, I can finally go back to Los Angeles. I'm afraid it's not over yet. Keep this opinion. The judge said that you could leave. Perry, so we can't actually prove that Kim Weatherly did it. Let's face it, we don't have to. After today's testimony, there's certainly a reasonable doubt that Warren killed Diane Draper. All right, you tell me. What is the judge going to do? I don't want to move for a dismissal until we have this case nailed down. Well, I've been through Kim's file a thousand times. We don't have any more on him. Maybe the answer isn't Kim. Kim isn't the killer? The killer typed a column which implicated Lauren, sent it to the computer at the magazine, stole, 
and probably destroyed the disc which contained the original column. Now, is that correct? So? You remember the Cold War? We discovered we could tell what the Russians were up to because they accused us of doing whatever it was they were doing. You think the killer wrote a column accusing Lauren of taking bribes because he was taking bribes? He or she, yes. It's an interesting theory. You know, this may sound silly, but I heard that Diane had a very big fight with Pietro Arnati, and she swore she'd never advertise or wear his line again. Is that right, Lauren? As far as I know. Look at these photos. When she was murdered, she was wearing an Arnati scarf. Was she wearing that scarf when you went to see her that night? I really don't remember. Well, try. I'm sorry. I don't remember. It's late. I'll uh, see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Good night, Lauren. Perry? Something's wrong. Very wrong. Remain seated. Come to order. Department 79 is now in session. The Honorable Renee Trayball presiding. Mr. Mason. Um, defense recalls Julia Collier to the stand. What are you doing? I think you know. Perry, no. She's my daughter. After 25 years, we're finally together. Please don't do this. You, uh, you knew Pietro Arnati, did you not? Yes. You also knew Marco Sabatini? Yes. Would you tell the court, please, who he was? He was a clothing designer based here in New York. Mr. Sabatini was recently killed in a hit-and-run car accident, was he not? Yes. Miss Collier... My associate, Mr. Milansky, is showing you bank records, which we will mark Defense Exhibit D. Those records show your deposits for the past year. You recognize them? Yes, these are my records. Now, he is also showing you bank records, which we will mark Defense Exhibit E. Those records contain all of the withdrawals from the account of Marco Sabatini for the past year. Now, would you explain why it is that in four separate instances, when Mr. Sabatini withdrew certain sums from his account, you deposited the exact same sums to your account? I don't know. Coincidence? Four times in the past year, clothes designed by Mr. Sabatini received extremely favorable coverage in the magazine you work for. So? So, wasn't Mr. Sabatini paying you in exchange for rave reviews? I wasn't the one taking bribes, Mr. Mason. Who was? Diane thought it was my mother. You mean according to Diane's column written the night of the murder? Yes. We discovered yesterday that Mr. Weatherly is unable to fully account for his whereabouts on the night of the murder, which means your whereabouts that night are not fully verified. Well, I was at home waiting for Kim to return. Do you always send the people you invite for dinner out to get their own Chinese? Well, no, but, but by the time I got home that night, I was too tired to cook. I mean, Kim was very understanding. You invited Kim over so he, he could give you some semblance of an alibi, did you not? I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm talking about the phone call Marco Sabatini made to you after Diane left his showroom that morning. You now have a copy of his phone records in front of you. He told you Diane had found out about the bribes you'd been taking. He told you she planned to expose the two of you in her column. So you invited Kim over, sent him out for Chinese food, then left the apartment shortly after he did and went over to Diane. No, I did not. You went through her garage and went up to her apartment. You tried to talk her out of exposing you. When she refused... 
You simply killed her. No, no. Then you sat down at her computer and transmitted a column that you had written, that you had written, which accused Lauren Jeffries of crimes you had committed. You transmitted that column to the computer at the magazine so she'd be blamed for the murder. No. Then you left, taking with you the computer disk containing Diane's column and jewelry. Jewelry you later planted at your mother's office to further implicate her. You also removed other evidence that proved you'd been taking bribes. Nothing that you're saying is true, all right? Nothing. Oh, it is true, Ms. Collier. It is true. So is the fact that you stole Kim Weatherly's credit card when he returned to your apartment that night. No! You stole his card and used it a few days later to rent a car. A car you then used to kill the one person who was still a threat to you. That person was Marco Sabatini. You know, you can't prove any of this. None of it. Oh, but I can, Miss Collier. I can prove all of it. Mr. Williger, please stand. I can call this young man as a witness. He waited on you at the agency where you rented the car. Now, Mr. Johansson, would you please stand? Mr. Malansky. Mr. Johansson is the mechanic who waited on you at the repair shop where you took the car to get fixed after the hit and run. We can call him as a witness, or we can enter that scarf into evidence as defense exhibit F. That scarf was found near Diane when you and the others found her dead. Was she wearing it when she was killed? No, Ms. Collier. She was not. You were wearing it. When you killed her, you got blood all over it. Blood all over it. You threw it near her, hoping people would think it was hers. Now, you did that, did you not? No, I did not do that. I mean, yes, the scarf is mine, but Diane borrowed it from me. No. I... It's a Pietro Arnotti scarf. A scarf she would never wear. <laughs> Oh, well, you, you must be very happy now, hmm? This time you'll be rid of me for good, won't you? Your mother suspected you all along. Diane told her about you and Marco, but she said nothing to me, nothing. She always tried to protect you, always. Yet you were willing to shut her away for life. Why? Because I hate her. I hated her when I was five. I hated her when I was 25. And I hate her now. In view of these developments, Your Honor, I move that the case against my client be dismissed. Prosecution concurs. So moved. Case dismissed. Bailiff, see to it that Miss Collier is properly attended to. This court is now adjourned. All rise. Just an act. Wasn't it? Mr. Mason, I look forward to the next time. Well, for what it's worth, this time wasn't easy. Wasn't? 
How old are you, Mr. Whalen? I'm uh, 29. Why? I wish I'd been as competent as you when I was your age. Thank you. Can I buy you dinner tonight? Oh, give me a rain check, will you? Uh, no, I have a better idea. The next time we oppose each other and you win, I'll buy you dinner. Thank you. Hmm. Think. Hey, Mr. Malansky. Your boss he does uh, nice work. Oh, thanks. I'll pass that along. Mr. Malansky, you saved me from making a big mistake. Uh, I owe you. Oh, no, you don't. Yes, I do. Hey, there's got to be something Mr. Nardone could do for you. Ken, how very thoughtful of you. Oh, it's lovely. <laughs> oh, don't. I'm taking it was the only way I could get him off my back. I guess I shouldn't tell her it's a gangster original, huh? What's wrong? Oh, it... Ken, it's it's so sweet of you, but and, and it's a gorgeous dress, but it's just not my style. Oh, sure it is. No, Ken, I I won't have you spending a lot of money for something that I'll never wear. I want you to return it. Return it? Well, that's no problem, is it? Thank you.